So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Live for three hours every Saturday night. It's a show that engages the mind, makes you think, and maybe even challenge what you think you know. Hi, I'm Jeremy Scott of Into the Parabnormal, where we talk about topics that are anything but mainstream, somewhere between abnormal and paranormal. Bring an open mind and join us for Into the Parabnormal. Live Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. Who were the real ancient Egyptians? What is it about ancient Egypt that captivates us all? The critically acclaimed series Magical Egypt is back with all new episodes. Let Chance Gardner and company take you on another adventure through Magical Egypt in the new series Magical Egypt 2. Magical Egypt 2 attempts a forensic reconstruction of the science of the ancients through a study of ancient aesthetics. Also, the best researchers and authors in the field like John Anthony West, Graham Hancock, Laird Scranton, Robert Duvall, Lon Mal Duquette, Aaron Sheik, and more join together to explore the topics of the esoteric and the hidden messages of the ancient Egyptians. Just go to MagicalEgypt.com right now and put in the code word FRINGE and get 10% off any download or order, including the groundbreaking original Magical Egypt series, as well as the new episodes in Magical Egypt 2. Also, check out the great work and the companion series at MagicalEgypt.com. Click the banner on the Fringe FM or go to MagicalEgypt.com and use the code word FRINGE and get 10% off your order today while it lasts. We told you weeknights on the Fringe FM are now... Now even better. And we mean it. Do it live! Where else can you hear the best shows and the best talent? Kick off your evening with our newest host, Alex Exum, live at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 Eastern. Hang out with me, Joe Roop, on Lighting the Void at 9 Pacific, Midnight Eastern. Ryan Gable expands your mind on the secret teachings at Midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern. We're bringing the heat every single night. Fire it up. The Fringe FM. From Studio 303, it's the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on The Fringe FM, bringing light to the stories that surround us. Brace yourself because a star in our galaxy is set to explode in one of the most energetic events in the universe. An international team of astronomers led by Joe Callaham from the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy recently discovered a pair of hot, luminous stars about 8,000 light-years from Earth, and one is teetering on the edge of a supernova. The team predicts that this will produce a gamma-ray burst, making the star the first known candidate for such an event found in the Milky Way. This story was published at CosmosMagazine.com. And colliding galaxy clusters look like the starship Enterprise. Is that the USS Enterprise blurring as it makes its jump to warp speed? Well, no, but a new photo of the galaxy cluster, Abel 1033, certainly does call the famous Star Trek starship to mind. The image, which was released Thursday, November 15th, is a composite that combines observations in optical light as well as X-ray and radio wavelengths. The later two, which is represented by colors blue and purple, respectively look like the USS Enterprise Evolution, the many faces of Star Trek's favorite starship. You can see the photo and the rest of the article at space.com. And a man from Wisconsin claims he saw an unidentified creature he believed looked like a pterodactyl. An anonymous man said that he and his father were driving home last August at about 2 p.m. when they came upon the creature. The eyewitness says the animal was approximately six feet tall and it had skin instead of feathers on its wings. Like a bat, he said, it looked like a pterodactyl or some kind of angel. He added that he was not able to gather video evidence, but that there could be other eyewitnesses. This story was posted at CryptozoologyNews.com. And time for this edition's fun fact. Running amok is actually a medically recognized mental condition. 
And that wraps it up for another edition of the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on the Fringe FM. I'm Vance Nesbitt, anchor and news sorcerer. This is Lighting the Void. It is Thursday night, November the 29th, on into the 30th. We are live on KTLK Digital Broadcasting, the Fringe FM. That is the Fringe.FM, and our website is LightingTheVoid.com. Dan, the man Lopez is here with me, and uh, you guys know that I have said many times I have three main goals here at Lighting the Void. The first is learning and exploring the out-of-body experience, which we talked about last night. The second is understanding mysticism, magic, and the occult, and what that's all about, and the subconscious. And the third is to contact life outside of our reality, or perhaps from other planets or star systems. Costa McCreese is here with us to discuss the People's Disclosure Movement, something that many are already doing, using what's known as the C5 Protocol. Uh, this is uh, going to be a very interesting topic because I know that uh, you've wondered if others are out there. Of course you have. That's why you listen to these types of shows, and that's why you listen to this show. But have you ever felt that the presence as if you're being watched, sort of like as, I don't know, it doesn't seem harmful, but you know that something's there. I mean, like, I find myself staring at the night sky quite often. As other people tend to bury their heads in their phones or perhaps their work. But I find myself staring up at the sky. And I know many of you have too because you told me that. So tonight's show, if that's you, this show is for you. Now Costa has quite a story to tell us and and also uh, to inform us about uh, the People's Disclosure Movement. Which I think is really cool. And we'll get we'll tell you about that here in just a second. And if some of you don't know, I've told also the story that I can tell you the time I felt it, the time I was working uh, on my friend's Jeff's house while listening to some esoteric audio books related to uh, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. I don't know if it was related, but it was around 3 a.m. when there was no one around, just me inside this house working, painting the walls and uh, trim, getting it ready for the next tenant. It was really dark. Uh, the neighborhood was asleep. Obviously, it's. 3 a.m. Not even the occasional dog bark was happening that night. But I went outside to my truck for a smoke break, and I leaned on the back fender to rest my legs because uh, I was tired. And if I stared up in the night sky because I always found the night sky was really beautiful at 3 a.m. in the morning, early morning especially. Uh, still, to this day, one of my favorite things to do. But this time, a star I've never seen before, a very large and very bright and almost huge star seemed to be in the center of the sky and I stared at it and it kind of seemed to stare back at me and just as soon as I thought about it thinking maybe is this thing staring at me nah 
not right. I don't, that can't be. And as soon as I started thinking that, then it turned. And it turned just like a spotlight on a cop car would. And it was gone. So after that, I always wondered if I had made some type of contact at that moment. I still don't know to this day. But from that day, it's been one of the biggest answers I've sought. Is there, are there beings out there? Can we communicate with them? Tonight, we'll touch on this subject and see that uh, others, according to CoStar, are actually communicating and that it's real. And we can do it as well. And if you don't know who Costa McCreese is, he's the founder of ETLetstalk.com, uh, which is a global community, uh, the People's Disclosure Movement, and the Global CE5 Initiative. Costa is an international networker and a creative artist working on behalf of healthy relations between all life, for- life forms. He was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana in 1953. In 1977, he earned a BA in computer science from Indiana University. He has been a successful software consultant in the Silicon Valley for almost four decades. But most importantly, he has been a dedicated spiritual activist since his teenage years. As a young man, Costa became fascinated with the mysteries of the universe, teaching himself astrology, meditation, astronomy, and reading widely on extraterrestrial UFOs, comparative religion, science fiction, spirituality, Atlantis, and many other metaphysical topics. His current passion and mission is the website ETLetstalk.com and the ET Let's Talk community, which has over 20,000 members in more than 100 countries. At the website, members join for free to learn how to successfully contact and interact with loving ET spiritual beings. Using the ET Let's Talk community, MAP members can also find others to create teams. Now, Costa founded and facilitates the People's Disclosure Movement, which contacts many benevolent star civilizations currently visiting the Earth. This movement bypasses governments and authoritative power structures by empowering people to interact directly with ET star beings in order to co-create with them a positive planetary uh, experience. Welcome to Lighting the Void, Costa. It's really good to have you on here for the first time. I'm so interested in this subject. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so very much, Joe. It's, It's my pleasure. So first, the things first, I got to know, you know, I told that little story about the one experience I had. I don't know if that's what that was, if it was a star just fading out. But to this day, I still felt like it was something that knew I was there. It felt as if something was communicating with me. Do you think that that might have been a a sign or have you ever heard of something like that? Oh, I hear about that a, 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 a lot of times. It's happened to me. Um, in, in that same way as it happened to you, um, I've had many experiences uh, uh, with multiple ones like that, and I know many people in, in uh, my ET Let's Talk community who uh, have had experiences like that too. And the fact that you had the feeling that it was looking at you and that you were communicating, that goes right to the core of what um, our human-initiated contact is really all about the C5 protocols, which, which are human-initiated, interactive uh, contact with uh, extraterrestrial beings. I think that you were maybe have, having that because what we do is we use our consciousness, our, um, our heart and our head, our consciousness, to reach out uh, to, to these beings and try to make that connection. It's quite possible that uh, very involuntarily, uh, without you knowing anything about CE5 or protocols, you were just naturally doing that when you had that feeling. So like I said, you, you were right there at the core of uh, the kind of approach that, uh, that, that we take as we teach people how to make this contact. So even though I can't say 100% that that was uh, you know, a StarCraft, um, you should trust your feelings. Know what you know. So when you, when you uh, even feel to this day that... Uh, uh, you were making that contact. It's it's probably pretty genuine. Uh, it's it seems to have um, it stayed with you all these years, and that just shows how deep it went. Right, and you know it's something I'll never forget about either. And it's it's funny now that I, I back then I used to think there's nobody thinking about these things or looking into this stuff. And now that we've done this radio thing, I know that that's not true. And you are. Um, into the uh, the people's disclosure movement, actually, what I don't, I don't have a clue what that is. What is that about? <laughs> Sounds like you got quite a few members. 
Yeah, we do, and we're growing all the time. Um, the the word uh, disclosure, if you're in the UFO field and you're on the Internet or you're going to conferences and reading books, disclosure, disclosure now is a big and hot topic. People want to know when is the government, any government, but you know our government, the, uh, the, the English, someone else, going to make that announcement where they say, yes, we are being visited. Yes, there's been a cover-up. Uh, forgive us, but they're here. They're clear. Get used to it. And that's called disclosure, and it's on a lot of people's lips. And they're making efforts to write petitions to governments, to uh, try to engage politicians, uh, all kinds of uh, actually real beneficial um, activities because I think it raises the conversation about disclosure and, and uh, educates uh, people about it. But so far, it, it's had very, very limited success as people wait for an authority to tell them, make that announcement, you know, through television, the Internet, or whatever that finally says, they're here. So it's disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. I looked, and, and I went along that same route myself, and I looked at all this effort and this energy being put by people who want this kind of disclosure and who are waiting. <clears throat> Maybe they're being a little bit active, but they're basically waiting for the authority structure somewhere. It might even be the church, somebody's church, you know, whatever, a government, uh, maybe some scientific institution to make that announcement. The People's Disclosure Movement turns that on its head because we teach people how to make their own contact directly with these star civilizations who are here, and thus we bypass uh, the need for any government or other authoritative institution to make that announcement. It takes your power back when you learn how to do this yourself, make your own contact. And what I like to say is people go from becoming, let's say, believers in this to becoming knowers. Once you've had a contact like, like you have, Joe, and others that are even more dramatic than that, some of which I've had too, and I can talk about those, you can never go back. You know, right. you know, you know what you know, and sometimes you want to shut it down because you can't talk about it. Sometimes you want to stand on a rooftop and say, hey, listen, everybody, this happened to me. Isn't this great? And you'll get different reactions. But the People's Disclosure Movement really is uh, something that was born in 2010 when I came up with the idea and just decided to empower everyday people to, to do this themselves. Stop waiting, t being supplicants to someone else and saying, please, 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 will you disclose, will you tell us? Just stop that and learn how to do it yourself. Find other people who are doing it in our community. Get together, share your experiences, your stories. Uh, crowdsource it, you know, uh, amongst yourselves, amongst ourselves. And that way, it's for up from the grassroots of people's disclosure rather than a top-down thing from any government. That's the heart of it. And I can tell a lot of stories and, uh, about what people have seen, the contacts they've made. But at the very core, this is really an empowering movement, and it's been growing. Um, as you mentioned, we have, um, as far as I know, 20,000 people now in more than 100 countries, and that's just the network that I run and founded, um, etletstalk.com. Uh, there are other networks uh, similar and in parallel uh, with what I'm doing that um, – are doing the same thing. They're making their own contact, and we try to collaborate uh, as best as we can and share with each other uh, because we realize this is really the, the future. Um, you know, we've been waiting decades for uh, the authorities to tell us what we already know, that there's a cover-up, and we're tired of it. So we've got the people's disclosure where uh, the people are disclosing now. And I'll tell you, that's a whole lot more fun. You take all that energy that you had waiting for someone to tell you something, and you use it yourself to form a group, to go out, you make your own contact, get your own videos, have your own experiences, and suddenly this thing just lights up for you, and you find other people doing it, and it just becomes something really wonderful and alive, and your energy is going in a positive direction where you're very active rather than having been passive um, with the, the standard okay. kind of disclosure. I got you. So really, it's kind of like we were talking about last night. Um, 
you know, I had a guest on and we were talking about the out of body experience and we had some people call in and text in and say, look, this is just, uh, this is so hard to believe. I just can't believe this. And I told them, I said, yeah, I thought that at first too, until I had my experience. So this is kind of like that hard to believe maybe until you actually have your own experience. And then you, I know exactly what you're talking about, how, you know, sometimes you're afraid to talk about it, but then you want to shout to the rooftops about it too, you know? And in, in the community that I've created, I recognize the fact that, uh, uh, over the years, it, it, you were thought to be crazy, and you, you couldn't come out with some of these stories. But you know what? Once you peel the layer off the top and you talk to another, enough people uh, in private where they feel safe, and you realize how many people have a story of sightings, it's amazing. Um, and they have a lot of reasons for keeping them quiet or some reasons for, for being vocal. It has changed so much over the decades that it's now quite a bit more acceptable. I won't say it's 100% acceptable to say you've had a UFO sighting or a communication with a being, but it's a whole heck of a lot better than it was 40 or 50 years ago when I first encountered this subject and became interested in UFOs. So I think we've been making a lot of progress in how people are accepting this now. I mean, it's not where it really needs to be, but this community at etletstalk.com is a safe place that I created for people to come together, tell their stories to each other um, without any retribution, and get the support they need, you know, emotional support, verification, learn new things. And that's what I love about this. It's it's a community. But for right now, what I would like your listeners to know is that um, our etletstalk.com community is is a safe place for them to come and tell their stories. The the CE5 initiative, i got to be honest with you, that's something that, well, just CE5 in general is something that I first learned about. Um, didn't I've heard it before. I heard people say it, talk about it. Didn't really know what it meant. And uh, I think <laughs> I kind of understand it, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead and talk about that. Oh, it's, it's very simple. Uh, I'll preface it by saying that uh, J. Allen Hynek, the, the very famous uh, ufologist and scientist, um, described close encounters of the first, second, third, and fourth kind. And you can, uh, I don't have them memorized, but one can go look on, on the Internet and see how Close Encounters CEs 1, 2, 3, and 4, how they differ. They all involve um, uh, sighting and contact with an unidentified uh, object to a lesser or greater degree. Uh, but what makes CE5 different, which stands for Close Encounter of the Fifth Kind, is that rather than being a passive experience, like Close Encounters 1 through 4, this is a human-initiated active experience where you use your consciousness in your heart and telepathy, and you make your own contact uh, by initiating it and then proceeding with a conversation or whatever the interaction is going to be like. So there's really no mystery about it. CE5, yeah, it sounds like, uh, um, you know, some some arcane scientific thing. It, it just means close encounters of the fifth kind. And to me, that's the most, the, the coolest kind because you get to initiate it. You don't sit around waiting and hoping and looking at the sky and saying, maybe someday I'll, I'll see something. Mm-hmm. No, uh, we teach people how very simply to pull up a lawn chair, uh, have a friend join them if they want, or they can do it alone, go into a state of relaxation. Some would call it meditation. Uh, do some visualization, do some thought, thoughts that they send out of welcome uh, to our star visitors. And uh, what we like to say is raise their vibration. I know that, that's kind of like an overused phrase, but basically raising that vibration means opening your heart and issuing a positive welcome rather than being in fear or in doubt or skepticism. Um, those are, are okay emotions, but you're likely not to have any success if that's what drives you. For people who are at least open-minded and are willing to, to sit down and uh, use the steps of this C5 protocol that we have on the website, um, they can do this very easily um, in their home, even in their living rooms, because we have found that uh, the ET beings were contact, that we contact 
don't just show up as lights in the sky. They also communicate uh, telepathically or through electronic uh, lights or even touches on the shoulders or on the knees, just a lot of different creative ways. So the CE5 protocol really is empowering because you can do it anywhere, anytime that's really safe uh, for you to sit down, relax, and, and get into it. And this is, uh, I've, I've noticed that a lot of people like to do this in groups or, or they uh, go out with, you know, friends or whatever, or like you said, the people that they, they find that are close to them. Do you find that a lot of people like to try to do this stuff alone or on their own? Some people do, and yet I find that most of the people who contact me, and I'm, on, I'm working on social media all the time promoting this and talking with people, learning from them, giving them advice. So I hear the same thing over and over from people who, who are new to this. They always ask me, is there someone nearby me in my city, in my town, who does this? Can you connect me with them? And that's why we created the, the CE5 member map um, on the etletstalk.com website so that people can go in and look at, at it visually and see the little markers there uh, and, and determine whether someone's close by and they can mouse over it and, um, and get an email address and try to contact the people. So, yes, people can do it alone, and some people are loners and like that, but I would have to say that most people just want to find company, even if it's one other person. or We have groups that are 30, 40 people, um, groups that are a half dozen. It doesn't matter. It's really the quality, not the quantity, uh, the quality of your, your positive, um, uplifting approach rather than being an, an approach of fear and skepticism and doubt. So it's the quality that matters. And like I said, most people want to find company, and that's why the community was created, so that they're able to do that. Okay. All right. That makes sense. I, uh, I'm i excited about this. i got to tell you, this is cool to me because uh, I'm one of those guys that I like to <laughs> I like to try to test things, uh, just like uh, you know the out-of-body experience. This isn't uh, yeah. just a speculation. We can actually go out and try to do this thing. But we've, we've got to take our first break. We'll be right back with Costa McCreese. You guys, if you've got any questions, remember... We're in the Spreaker chat as well. If you just search the Fringe FM or Lighting the Void in Spreaker, you can also contact the show via text at 501-777-5631. We'll be right back after these words. Lighting the Void Radio. The truth is out there. There's something out here. And so are we. KTOK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe FM. Do you ever wonder why there's so much show in politics? Do you ever wonder why America's not getting fixed? Ever wonder why our media is not reporting the news? They report only their biased opinion. Are you tired of feeling like a controlled rat? Do you wonder what's next? If you're looking for answers, join me, Ronnie McMullen, for my new show, Deep Waters Radio. That's Deep Waters Radio. Monday nights, 9 p.m. Pacific, right here on The Fringe FM. Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies in a Capsule. It's a great product. And the one thing I, I like about it the most is that when you open the bottles, you can smell, like, the, the scent of the fruits and veggies. It's no genius thing to it. It's really just fruits and veggies, which everyone needs. And they kind of, you guys kind of put it in a way where you can take it easy and you can get it, and it's natural, and, and that's what I like about it, you know? I like the product, and uh, I've taken it, and, and it's, it's definitely made me feel a lot better. You know, I am a healthy person to begin with, 
Uh, but it's it's a it's definitely good prevention, and uh, it's definitely gives me energy, and I feel like it's a natural thing. I like it. I really do. For a limited time, use discount code TALK to receive a 50% discount on your first preferred whole health system and have it shipped to you free. Call 1-800-246-8751 or go online to balanceofnature.com. Again, use discount code TALK. When I'm done running with the wolves after hunting down a half-ton bison, I look forward to a mind-teetering escapade evening on The Fringe FM. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. This is Cortana from Shift Happens, telling you to pour a glass and park your ass because you're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. Shifthead. Folks, this is very important information. What's to be said about CBD? AncientLifeOil.com. Our CBD is made from hemp and has 0.003 THC, which means this wonderful product won't get you high. No matter what amount you take, what does CBD do for the body? My hands are tied. But you can Google CBD benefits and be astounded. When you're finished reading, you'll want to log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com and purchase. Life is good when you feel good. People are tired of pain. People are asking for non-GMO organic products to help them with, (laughs) you fill in the blank. Legal in 49 states, and again, our CBD is made from hemp. Ancient Life Oil is about helping people. One by one by one. If you wonder how good the product is, the CEO takes it every day without miss. AncientLifeOil.com. That's AncientLifeOil.com. Have a great day. Alex. I was thinking about the cops because I was looking at photos and stuff online. It seems like more and more I'm seeing police with tattoos and it just, I'm sorry. I can't tell the gangbangers from the cops now. I mean, what if they had them on their face? Now that would be crazy because that's where it really originates from. A lot of people don't know that. I know it's a big thing now on like rappers and everybody's doing it. Gang members have them. Everybody's kind of doing it now. Musicians and tattoos on their face, crosses, crucifix and stuff like that. Crucifix, that's what's really funny to me because it's all satanic. All of it. All of it. All of it. Tattoos are straight from hell. Hell sent. Straight from hell. Straight from the bowels of hell. All tattoos. All tattoos. Period. End of story. Oh, you didn't know that. Because they were trying to represent the actual demon gods that they worshipped. Straight from hell. Pure evil. Straight from the bowels of hell from Satan himself. KTOK Digital Broadcasting. The Fringe FM. Howdy. This is Catalina, and you're listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop. Welcome back to Lighting the Void. That is a new group that's letting us play their bumper music, which I really love. That's a group called Carbon Based Life Forms, and that song's called Interloper. If you've never heard of it, you should really check them out. Uh, but we're here with uh, Costa McCreese, and we are talking about the People's Disclosure Movement. His website is etletstalk.com. And um, you, like I said before we started the show, Speaking with extraterrestrials, interdimensional beings, things like that, something I've always wanted to do, and now that I'm hearing through the grapevine that a lot of people are doing it, and uh, Costa McCreese is one of the one of the bigger groups in this field. And I, you know, I wanted to ask you, uh, Costa, that something happened to you. I mean, I want to hear about your experience, something that changed you. You had to have a big experience to put your life into this because you're really into this. It's not just something you're talking about. It's what you're all about now. 
Yeah, that is what I'm all about. It, um, I had uh, two life-changing experiences that led me to us having this conversation and having the community I have. And I love telling the stories because, for one thing, everyone's got a story. Uh, you, you, I have talked to so many hundreds of people who've had sightings and had communication and up close and personal encounters to know that I'm not unique. So I'm going to tell you a couple of the stories that, that really changed uh, things for me. But uh, I want people to know that I am not unique. Uh, there are many, many like me. And they, each person decides for themselves, once they've had the experience, what they're going to do with it. And it's something only you can do and in the silence of your own heart. So here's what happened with me. And I'll give you a little bit of background because uh, it, these experiences didn't come out of a vacuum. When I grew up in the Midwest in the 60s and in the 70s, um, it was a time when no matter what you think of NASA now, and there are people who are detractors, but back then the moonshots, the Apollo program, the Mercury, the Gemini programs were all over the news, and they inspired a whole generation of, of young people to want, to want to go into science. So I was like that, where um, I was enthralled by the space program of the day, and I was old enough to understand and had scrapbooks. I was also interested in science fiction, and I read a lot. I was interested in astronomy and had my own telescope. I would take it out on cold Indiana winter evenings and just gaze up at the stars and look through the telescope and uh, just was blown away by the magnificence, magnificence of, the, of the universe. So that's the setting where my eyes were towards the sky in one way or another. I encountered my first UFO book uh, probably when I was 10 or 11. It was a paperback. I forget the title, but it had a picture on the cover of a very classic 1950s type of UFO shape, you know, with the saucer and the dome on top. And back then, you know, obviously people didn't have um, Photoshop, uh, ordinary people, so there were lots of pictures being taken that, um, that I think were genuine. This book had a lot of them in there, and I was just blown away. I was smitten then. And... Um, I knew I had to learn more, so I started reading more about the UFO topic. But you know, I had I had a pretty conventional life after that. There was really nothing I could do with my interest after reading a few books, and I was a believer. Um, I got a degree in computer science, a minor in math, um, went into a job after college, got married, had a couple kids, got divorced, got remarried, you know, a very typical kind of thing these days, yeah. until 2006, when I was surfing the Internet. I was bored one afternoon, and I thought to myself, you know, I wonder what, what's going on with the UFO topic these days. And wow, oh my God, it was like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> because, uh, you get on the Internet there, and you do searches, you know, for UFOs, extraterrestrial, and there was just a lot there. Now, granted... Back then, as in today, and probably more today, a lot of fakery is out there, a lot of disinfo. But nonetheless, I, I found myself um, surfing and reading what I could. I discovered a group of people at that time who would go to uh, Mount Shasta, which is here in Northern California, because um, I was living and still live in the San Francisco Bay Area. About four hours away, this group of people um, were doing something new, which was the CE5 the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, making human-initiated contact. And they were saying, come out here for a week and join us. Under the stars, we'll make contact. Well, my eyes just got really big when I discovered that and thought to myself, part of me was afraid and part of me was really excited because I grew up with all the bug-eyed alien movies that were coming out of Hollywood, you know, and so th that childish part of me was, or childlike part of me, was a little bit scared about going and doing an experience like that. But the majority part of me was just like, oh, my God, I, I've got to go. I've got to try this. Right. You know, I want to see one for real. And at that time, um, my wife was very supportive. And uh, th by the way, this is something I, I've also discovered in my um, ET Let's Talk community. Um, marriages have broken up over this kind of topic where people don't see eye to eye. Uh, there are family members that try to commit to uh, institutions, other people who say they've had sightings 
or are interested in this topic. So I was very fortunate that when I discovered this group that was inviting people to come out and learn how to make contact, that my wife was supportive. What a blessing. Yeah. She said, and I asked her, why don't you come with me? She said, no, you know what? It's a really big universe. I know that they're out there. I know there's life. It's just. She wasn't into it as you were, but she supported but, your efforts. But, but, but go have fun. I support you. Okay. Great. I went. I had fun. So every night, uh, we actually were seeing lights in the sky. We were seeing orbs flitting about in the trees. We learned during that week how to identify what was um, known, you know, airplanes, satellites, um, planets, whatever, so that we could eliminate the known things and experience uh, the, the stuff that really was what I believe StarCraft because they, they behaved intelligently when we would flash our lights at them. So I was calling my wife every morning after telling her about the previous night's experiences. Very exciting for me. You know, it was all very new. And long about, um, I think about the fourth or fifth morning, just before I could start talking to her about what had happened the night before, she stopped me. And she said, wait a minute, I've got a story to tell you. And I thought to myself, wow, what could be more interesting than what I saw last night? But <laughs> go ahead. And she proceeded to tell me that here in our home, um, that previous night, she had just uh, turned off the light, uh, was laying in bed, and was just getting herself comfortable, scooting down, getting the covers over her uh, to fall asleep. Like I said, the lights were off. And um, I should say that my wife is a practicing professional clairvoyant. She has internal psychic clairvoyant sight. But what happened to her in that moment was with her physical eyes. As she got comfortable there in bed with the lights out, she looked at the foot of our bed, and standing at the foot of our bed were four, maybe five, white, short, bipedal beings looking at her. And they were the classic large head, large eyes, maybe small mouths, um, two arms, and presumably a couple legs because they were standing behind the foot of the bed, so the, bed, the edge of the bed was obscuring their lower half. But there were four of them, and she said maybe a fifth one standing behind the other four. Um, they, they were not, um, you know, a mist or anything. She clearly saw them. They're looking at her, and she says that um, she was not frightened. She was startled. But what she felt from them in her heart was these waves of energy, of love, coming off of them into her. And she just felt all this love and all this sweetness. And in her mind, she heard them telepathically say to her, Who are you? Who are you? They were asking who she was. And what we speculate now is that during the week I was up there making contact with uh, the group in Mount Shasta, we were probably attracting all kinds of a, a, attention from star beings uh, by doing our meditations and making contact. We, we speculate that because I'm so close to my wife, my wife and I was talking to her, that possibly they followed my energetic connection to her back from Mount Shasta to our home. And that's why they were saying, like, okay, we followed this energy. Here's something at the other end. Who are you? We're just speculating. But I wonder if that has to do with, when you say energy, I wonder if they followed love. You know what I mean? Like, that kind I, of energy. I believe that. I believe that, and that's what we work with with the with, uh, C5 protocols. And to finish that particular story, um, her mind went blank. She, said, she now says she should have asked them a million things, but all she could kind of think of was, where are you from? <laughs> she says today if she had to do it all over again, she would ask them, how did you get here? <laughs> right. Which is probably a, a more interesting question. But anyway, she asked, where are you from? And slowly in her mind, she says, these syllables formed that went Arcturus, Arcturus. Now, even though she was into the space program as a, as a kid as well, she was not into really into astronomy or science fiction. She didn't know anything about stars, the names of stars, constellations, etc. So as she's telling me this story, she says, Costa, is Arcturus a place? I go, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's that's Astronomy 101. It's a star. I think it's a a super red giant, and it, yeah, it's a real star. So she claims that maybe she might have heard the the word Arcturus subconsciously, and and it came up in her consciousness at that moment. Or they could have clearly communicated it pretty genuinely to her. But that's the answer she got. And then they just kind of dissolved. They disappeared there at the foot of the bed. They just like faded out and they were gone. So that was her story. And at the end of that, I mean, my jaw hit the ground. It's like (laughs) I was seeing lights in the sky bouncing around and changing directions, which was really cool. But what I was seeing was nothing like what she had just experienced. So I gathered my jaw off the ground, and she says to me, you know, next year when you go on this um, outing again to do this, I'm coming with you. It's, it's real for me now. Wow. So, so she was all in at that point. She was all in, and I'll tell you the second story from that week, where which got me totally, I mean, I was all in by then, but which put me over the top, and that was... Um, one of the nights during that week, um, we had finished our meditation. It was, I think, near midnight. We had a group of 40 people, and the group was breaking up. We had had a successful night of seeing and having contact in the skies and seeing orbs in the trees, things like that. So people were happy. Most people got in their cars and were heading back to close the night, back to their uh, hotel rooms. Uh, ten of us still lingered around in this uh, open clearing uh, still talking about what we, we had seen. And someone tugged on my sleeve and pointed off to my right and said, look at that. And I looked off in the bushes. It had to be like six or eight feet away, not very far. And I had to rub my eyes and make sure this wasn't a trick of my eyes or of the the, the rising moon because there was foliage, there was um, there were um, bushes and trees, you know. And I I saw this sphere, maybe about six foot in diameter, start materializing out of thin air slowly, you know, like you were just doing a slow dissolve. And like I said, I was rubbing my eyes going, am I seeing what I'm seeing? Other people were seeing the same thing because they were all staring in that direction. And this thing, um, I won't say it became real physical solid, but it became the contours and the face of it were so distinct that it was a sphere. It was floating there. Um, off the forest floor, very um, without a sound, noiselessly. Um, there was no wind, there was no vibration, no other kind of um, environmental thing going on that I recall. It was just there, and it was opaque. I it, it looked gray to me. Other people described other colors, but I couldn't see into it. But there's a sphere floating there, and I'm going, uh, what the heck? It was one of those moments. And for half an hour it floated there, um, and there was a woman standing next to me, I'll call her Gloria, not her real name, who who was part of this. Uh, like I say, it was myself and nine other people, so all of us saw this. Uh, so either it was a mass hallucination, it was a damn good one, if it was, or we were really experiencing something. Um, one of the people from across the circle there, as we're watching this thing, just sitting there, shouted out to the group and said, hey, I just got a telepathic message from the beings who are inside of this. And they told me that they're scientists and they're here on Earth studying human energy systems, like our auras, our biomagnetic fields that we talk about. And I thought, oh, great, we're somebody's Ph.D. thesis. They're doing field work, right? Well, that's okay. Scientists are cool. So that's what this person told us. It gave us a little bit more context. Right. Of, well, uh, as long as we're not, they're not, we're not being treated like uh, rats. We're cool, right? I mean, exactly. <laughs> and, and we weren't. And the woman next to me, Gloria, was standing straight as a board. I went over. I, I turned around to, to talk to her. She was like no more than two feet from me, and she was standing straight with her arms held out at ninety degree angles, but parallel to each other, just um, not moving. And I thought to myself, "Whoa." something's going on, um, I'm not going to interrupt it because it doesn't look like it's a bad thing, um, but I'm going to stay here close to her just in case there's any signs of distress. So for that half hour, she stood still like that with her arms out motionless, and I didn't know what was going on. At the end of the half hour, she kind of shook a little bit, 
and I grabbed her by the shoulders to steady her because I thought, you know, she might fall. And she was a little disoriented. So I was asking her, Gloria, do you know your name? How many fingers? You know, where are we? Who am I? Kind of thing. And she said, I'm fine. I'm okay. And I asked her what happened. And she said that one of the beings from inside of this uh, floating sphere approached her telepathically and asked her if he or she or it could merge with her in order to study her energy system. And to her credit, and this woman is a good psychic, which is probably why she was approached, because she was very open and uh, could receive a telepathic message. But she has a lot of guts because she 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 answered this um, proposition that she was given about, may I merge with you to study you? She said, well, yeah, okay, you can, but I have three conditions. One is that you leave when I tell you to leave, and two is that I remain conscious of my surroundings. I don't want to be, like, knocked out and unaware. And three is you don't do anything sexual with me. I don't want any probes and all that. Right. And this being said, okay, 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 to her three conditions. And so what was happening during that half hour was um, they were experimenting, and it wasn't hurting or anything. And finally, at the end of, the end of that half hour, she, she told the being, okay, I'm done, go. And they did. And that's the point at which this um, sphere started dissolving and went away. And she told us the story. So take that, uh, you take that kind of experience, and it violated the laws of physics such as I knew them, because <laughs> things just don't appear like that and hover and then disappear in the face of nine other witnesses. So what I had at the, in that moment was my up-close and personal sighting in a way that did not make me fearful. You know, I was with other people. I was in the company of others. This was done very gently um, and quietly and m amazingly. So I said to myself, what am I going to do with this? Um, I decided I want to discover more. I want to delve more into this. And I want to teach other people how to do what we have just been doing because I'm not that special. You know, if I can do this through meditation and get these kinds of results, I'm sure everybody can. So that's when I started thinking about organizing people um, with this global CE5 initiative. And we've been doing this every month now uh, in our community where we get our groups together uh, all over the world and we join with each other in thought and in visualization and in a network, uh, in a community where we're welcoming as a combined community are star visitors, and they're from lots of different places. And for one day every month, and we've been doing this for eight years, um, usually near the new moon so that it's a dark sky, our global CE5 community does this uh, linked-up meditation, and then they send reports to me and put them on the website or on our Facebook page of uh, the contact they've made. And the contact just ranges. It's all over the map. People get videos. People get pictures. People get telepathic messages. They have lucid dreams. Uh, the contact happens in a lot of ways. And so that's the whole idea of teaching other people to do this, being in a community and growing the community so that we hope one day there will be many more thousands of human beings who are ready en masse to make contact and, and to, to bring our star visitors down into full open contact because we're not yet ready for that. But that's the, the story of my background and what made me or helped me decide that I want to organize and teach other people and provide a community for them to experience something like I did. You know, when I was thinking, you know, during the break, I said, Costa, you got one of the most pleasant audio voices. I mean, you could do podcast and radio. I'd listen to you tell stories all day long. <laughs> I've met only a few people like that. Uh, and oh. Now that you're telling me about your experience, I could totally understand why you're doing it because it would be all that I would be doing, trying to get more answers. I, just, you know, yeah. I have a curious nature like that, and I don't. I know you too. You do too. But this kind of confirms for a lot of us that there are ties to what we call spirituality and ETs, right? 
Right. I mean, most I think, of us think that it's not that sometimes some of us think it's two separate things, but the after hearing what you're telling me, I don't think it is, or at least you guys met uh, a race or certain beings yeah. that were into what yeah. we call spirituality uh totally i um this is a a, a spiritual practice for me, and uh, you know that's the word spiritual in the widest sense, you know. Uh, this is not a cult. It's not a religion. I'm, I may be the founder and facilitator of this, but it's not about me or my ego. This is about the group and group love and where we're going as a species. What's tied into this that I haven't talked about yet is that a lot of these civilizations we have learned, they have told us, are here out of concern for what we're doing to our planet and to each other. And we're on the brink of nuclear war or climate change or biological war or something possibly destroying life as we know it on earth and there's a lot of promise that we can break through and do better than we have been and that i think has attracted the interest of these different civilizations and they have told us that they want to help they they've told us they will not do our growing for us we have to uh, figure out as humans how to fix our problems but there's some problems that are maybe too big for us to fix, and these civilizations have told us they're here to kind of to, to co-create, to lend a hand where our human free will is not violated, to, you know, to do our own growing and our own fixing, but where they can lend a hand. Like they they have said, um, don't. And, and I've gotten these telepathic messages myself and through my wife. They've said, don't think of us as gods. We are elder brothers sisters and cousins uh, we're your family and of course a statement like that you can take and delve, delve into it and dive into it a whole lot but I took that as face value in a very friendly way that the vast majority of these civilizations are in fact friendly they're here to help and they've shown us time and again in different with different experiences of my own and of other people that I've talked to in the community They've shown us that they're benevolent and loving, and, and as you said, spiritual. Right. Um, they want us to meet, they want us to meet them halfway. Their civilizations may have encountered the same kind of horrible problems we human beings have encountered, which is we we can't get along, we kill each other, we destroy the planet. But I I I can see the evidence. If they're here visiting us, it means they overcame their problems. They evolved spiritually and materially so that they're here now to say we did it we're here to help you you can do your own growing but you can do it too and we want to help and that's the big picture of how i see what is happening um, with this kind of contact it is a spiritual thing it's about the survival of the human race and all the life forms on the planet wow. and what they in 2010 i got a message from them and they because i asked them you know, should I spend a lot of time organizing people to do this contact? Um, I have a day job. I'm an engineer, and I'm wiped out at the end of the day. If I'm going to be doing this organizing, that's really labor-intensive, uh -huh. being on the Internet. If this is of any value to ET intelligence, I'll do it. But if it's not, then I won't. Their response to me telepathically was, um, and this was through my wife, was very, very... Um, clear which is yes please organize in fact build us we want you to build create as many et contact teams as possible in as many places as possible as quickly as possible That's because awesome. that will give us permission to show up in more places and as we show up in more places in more cities in your skies more people will see us that will give us permission to show up in even more places where so. more, even more people will see it. And they say this will organically grow the movement until a tipping point is reached where so many people have seen us and have interacted with us all over the world that no government, no institution can ever again deny our existence, cover it up, manipulate, lie to all of you. You yes. will have become closure. And that's when I thought, okay, this is the people's disclosure. Bingo, that's it. That's Very so good. awesome. Listen, we got to take a break. Uh, we're at the uh, top of the hour here. More from Costa McCrease. ETLetstalk.com is the website. 
We'll have all the links, too, for the archives. Go check it out while you're listening. We'll be right back. This is Sammy. Join us in the Deep South as we're lighting the void with Joe Roop on the Fringe FM. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation. And angioprim is the result, a safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now for a special radio offer from angioprim. That's angioprim.com slash radio, A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M, angioprim.com slash radio, or call 877-882-7221. That's 877-882-7221. From Studio 303, it's the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on the Fringe FM, bringing light to the stories that surround us. Astronomers using a telescope in Chile have discovered a star whose strange dimming and brightening of light are reminiscent of Tabby's star, which was once suggested to host an alien megastructure. The megastructure idea, first posted in 2015, was later quashed by data, suggesting that the dips are probably from dust particles obscuring the star's light. The new star's behavior is probably not due to aliens either, but it's baffling, says astronomer Roberto Sayato of Federal University of Santa Cantaria in Brazil. He and his colleagues reported the star's flickering back on November 6th. This was brought to you by ScienceNews.com. And as antique gold coins from the Middle East pour into the United States, some looters are turning to the spirits called the Jinn in their hunt for gold treasure. A few gold seekers even go as far as to get the Jinn to possess them in hopes that the spirits will guide them to the hidden jackpot. However, research by archaeologists and an investigation conducted by Live Science suggests that rarely, if ever, does using the gin help looters find gold artifacts. Rather, metal detectors and mass excavation of archaeological sites seems to be the most effective way of looting treasure. And a new report of a dogman spotted in California. A California man shares his encounter with what he believes was a dogman creature. The Dogman is a cryptid reputed to live in the northwestern quadrant of Michigan's Lower Peninsula. Although other sightings have been documented in other states, such as Wisconsin, this unproven creature was first reportedly spotted back in 1887 by two lumberjacks who described it as having a human body and a dog's head. And in 2017, a woman in Michigan claimed to have seen a similar creature. In 2015, a group of three people in Michigan reportedly came across an unidentified dog-like creature in the woods of St. Clair County. You can read all about the dog man at cryptozoologynews.com. And time for this edition's fun fact. There is a basketball court on the top floor of the U.S. Supreme Court building. Its nickname? The highest court in the land. And that wraps it up for another edition of the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on the Fringe FM. I'm Vance Nesbitt, anchor and news sorcerer. Magic, the occult, history, health, news. 
These are just a few subjects discussed on my radio broadcast, The Secret Teachings. I offer unique and objective perspectives on new and old subjects alike, while welcoming guests and presenting my own research with no filter. Visit my website for more information and to subscribe to my archive at www.thesecretteachings.info and find me on The Fringe FM live Monday through Friday, midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. Hey, it's Grace. Can we talk about something serious for a minute? Your age. Getting old has its perks. But remember, being a few years younger, you know, your hair was thicker, you didn't have so many wrinkles, that extra weight wasn't haunting you, and you just felt better. Well, we can't turn back the clocks and go back 10 or 15 years, but you can start feeling and looking 10 or 15 years younger with Nature's Youth RSF. It's a doctor-formulated daily supplement that helps your body maintain its peak performance and fight the aging process. Imagine sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. See how Nature's Youth RSF has helped thousands of people just like you at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. Imagine how it will feel when your family and friends are asking you what you did to look so good. Your secret will be Nature's Youth RSF. It's time to start looking better and feeling better. Learn more and order your Nature's Youth RSF at naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. So call Joe, pick up the phone, dial 1-800-588-0335, toll free from the United States or Canada. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. All right, so Costa McCreese is our guest tonight, and uh, I believe this is actually the first... I want to say that this is the first radio show that we've had on Lighting the Void about contacting ETs. And um, you were just, before the break, you were telling us about the uh, some of the experiences you had back in 2006 and in 2010. By the way, the website, if you want to check out the website, it's etletstalk.com. And uh, I'm just wondering, I have to ask real quick, and we can get this out of the way, Costa, is... Have you ever ran into any beings that didn't seem so friendly? Well, that's a question that comes up a lot. Um, my answer is no. And I have to say that most of the people in my community, and I've, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of reports over the last 12 years, have not had negative experiences either. Now, let me just say I, I don't believe that um, there aren't and haven't been uh, more selfless or selfish races visiting here, service to self, rather than service, selfless service, right, in the past. So I, I don't believe it's always been positive, but I think it's been overwhelmingly positive, and especially at this time, I think it's even more so that way. When we use the C5 protocols to get into a state of love and acceptance, we raise our vibration to a point where we're going to attract, even if we attract interdimensional beings or ET beings, it's going to match our vibration. Um, if we're people who are in, in fear and skepticism or anger or whatever, then um, energies will be attracted to that to, to match too. So that's why it's important that uh, we teach people uh, to be in love and acceptance. That's a natural protection. So that even if there are negative entities around, uh, they won't they won't be able to do any harm. But I, I like to to focus on the positive. Like I said, the sure. experiences have been overwhelmingly positive, and a lot of love has been shown to people in our community, and and that's what keeps us coming back. Since those experiences that you had, that your wife had, and that you had, did that uh, cause more experiences to happen? Have you had? Uh, ones that were equal to that encounter or better since then? Uh, boy, how, how does one weigh these? They're, they're each different. Right. I've, yeah, I've had others that were just as dramatic. Uh, uh, I, I hold um, three retreats every year where we get a small group of 15 to 20 people together for six days and six nights um, in three different locations across the country, in Bloomington, Indiana, Joshua Tree in the Southern California desert, 
and at Mount Shasta in Northern California. And it's at those places um, for the last few years where we have had dramatic experiences. During the break, I was talking to you about uh, what we saw at Joshua Tree. Um, it was last year um, in October uh, 2017. And that was at night. A um, Towards the end of the night, a spaceship, um, it was a bright light, not... Um, See, that one was only two miles away because we were using some line of uh, eyesight ways to estimate. And I, I later used Google Maps with landmarks to figure out where this thing was. But it was hovering close to the ground about two miles from the group and signaling us with a, a series of different lights as we signaled back with um, our flashlights at it. And this lasted for half an hour. And that was pretty dramatic because... Even though it didn't come any closer and we were hoping it would fly over whatever, the group, it didn't do that, but it, it hung around for that time. It tipped up and down. It flashed its lights in different sequences. And then uh, my wife, who I mentioned earlier, who is um, a professional clairvoyant and very telepathic, more so than I am, although I am too, but far more than I am, she got a message from that craft, and they said to her, we will be back between 12.15 a.m. and 12.45 a.m., but it will be different. And she told me that, and then a, a minute or two later, this um, the, the ship we were watching off in the distance there in the night it just blinked out. Hmm. So we hung around, and sure as shooting, uh, at about 12.40 a.m., with five minutes to spare on that uh, prediction that we were that she was given, at 12.40 a.m., in the other part of the sky, above the town of Yucca Valley, um, above a mountain ridge, we saw a bright light just turn on and start flashing at us. And it stayed for five minutes. And we realized that was them returning, but in a different way. It was a different part of the sky uh, at a higher elevation, but clearly communicating because it, the, they will power up with their light and then they power down very intelligently, especially if you flash your light at them they'll flash back. So we had some communication uh, with them when they returned there. And that was really cool. And then they were gone. I mean, that was just really cool because it wasn't just a light in the sky flitting about. There was that actual communication where they said, here's something we're going to do. And then they did it. They showed up again. Um, that's dramatic for me. And and it, it, it underscores something that I'd like to tell people, which is the lights in the sky are great, but what matters is the love on the ground and the beings who are in there. There's intelligent spiritual beings piloting these craft from many civilizations, um, many different star systems, and you have to think about the, them as more than just lights in the sky. This is not just a like a three-ring circus or sea world where they're there to perform, but they're there to communicate and, and connect with us to the extent that we'll allow them and that, that we will be still enough to try to, to to make that communication mind to mind. So that's what I like to tell people is um, think about the fact that you are really looking at not just a light out there, but at a group of intelligent beings who see you in the way that you, Joe, felt that that star that you were looking at saw you. Well, we've had these experiences over and over where we know quite literally, because they've talked to us and said, hey, we're here, we're going to come back. And that's what's really exciting. They're real. They're star people. And I'll, I'll tell you one more story along those lines, if you would like. Sure. Um, and that is, um, um, if you remember, I earlier made a remark that uh, we once got a telepathic message where they said to us, uh, think of us not as gods, but as um, elder brothers, sisters, and cousins, you know, right. uh, E.T., we're family. Not too long after I got that message, I was uh, driving on the highway here um, to the the state capital, Sacramento. I was driving to, to meet my wife, Hollis, who was um, there attending to some family business. And I'm in the, the left lane on this big highway. It's called Highway 80, uh, four-lane highway, I think, at that point. I'm in the fast lane just zoning out like we do, you know, long stretches where you're you're going faster than you should be on the speed limit, and you zone out a little bit. And, and that's the state I was in, and I got to thinking in my in that state uh, about uh, that message we'd received from 
the ETs, uh, brothers, sisters, and cousins kind of thing. And at that moment, something happened that broke me out of my um, kind of hypnotic driving trance. On my right side, and keep in mind, I'm in the left lane, but on my right side, in that lane, this semi-trailer, semi-truck, full, full-on truck, comes whipping past me. I was already doing 80. This guy must have been in that lane doing like 100, maybe 90, whatever. He just went past me easily. And that startled me, and it's like I came to, and I'm going, okay, uh, uh, i got to be careful. There might be some crazy people on the road here besides myself. Followed that tr- semi-trailer at that moment was followed by a second one, and I was very alert for the second one now because of the, the first one had surprised me, right? The second one goes by me not quite as fast because as he passes me on the right, um, I can see on the back of his his trailer there in the same way that um, maybe when if you've ever seen a, a car window that's dirty and you, you felt like pulling a prank as a kid. Actually, I've done this as an adult. Um, you write, wash me with your fingers because yeah. <laughs> yeah. the window's dirty and you right. go, you think you're clever, you're cool, and you're, you're going to upset somebody. Um, but in the same way that you do that, there were letters written on the back of this huge, big letters, like in print, uh, written on the back of the trailer truck as it's going by me. And I look up and I go, what, what is that? What does that say? And what it said was, ETs are family. And then it was gone. That's weird. That's either one heck of a synchronicity or a message or... Stuff like that's um, yeah. just not coincidence. You know it's not. No, the only thing I can think of is that's got to be a, a, either a sadistic truck driver who stopped at, <laughs> at a road stop and wrote that on there just to mess with somebody on the road, right? Okay, uh-huh. that could have been a prank. But considering that that's where my mind was and that's what had just been the message I was given, and here I am randomly on the road going somewhere, and this random truck goes by, and it says that specific message. Um, I, don't think, I don't think that was random. But that's how they communicate. And that's what I'm trying to say is they're trying to tell us we're not just lights in the sky. We're not just bug-eyed beings. There's many different civilizations. Many of them look humanoid. Some may not. But their consciousness and love and spiritual evolution is what they're about. And that's what they're trying to tell us is we are beings, talk to us, communicate with us. We have things to learn from each other and take it to that level after you get uh, surprised by the lights and all the other things, the glitter that gets your attention, then go a little bit deeper and realize we're cosmic family and we're here to help. You know, I, um, when the, when I first started thinking about aliens, I, thought, I always thought about the the typical images go through my mind. The flying saucer, the gray alien with the big eyes. Yeah. And that they come from another planet somewhere in a fancy ship. But that's it, right? That's what where my mind stops, or it used to. But from what I'm gathering now is is there are all kinds, like you say, all kinds of different beings that come from many different places that they can move. I guess they can move interdimensionally right or do they have superior technology have you witnessed yeah. it yeah they they clearly do um there are there are a lot of stories out there about their appearances at military installations where they've hovered there and they've shut off um entire series of nukes you yeah. know freaking out the nuclear command you know there's stories about their technology and you realize that when they they can do that, that if they really had bad intentions toward us, they could they could vaporize us. You know, if they're able just to hover there and turn off 10% of the uh, nuclear force in the U.S., and that's what the headline said in the, in the regular papers, 10% of the nuclear force went down um, at, in Nebraska there. I forgot what the date was. Um, and I hear that it also happened in Russia at installations. My, my point being is, yes, They've got some cool technology, and um, they're mostly trying to warn us against our own folly. Why are you messing with weapons like this uh, that that could destroy life as you know it on your planet? Uh, You know, get it together and start cooperating 
and you can have the technology like we will. They really want to come and work with us fully and openly, but only when humanity really is ready, and we're not ready yet. Um, although I will say, and I want to tell your listeners this, um, an amazing, am- amazing research that I discovered uh, about a year ago, uh, there was this, um, there is this uh, firm called Glocalities.com in the Netherlands that uh, does research on different topics. They published um, a paper, which is still available as a PDF on their website. That's at Glocalities.com. And um, they, asked, uh, they, they, they asked a lot of questions about global adult attitudes towards extraterrestrial life. Two questions that they asked stood out for me. Uh, one, the first question was, do you believe that um, extraterrestrial civilizations exist out there? Not just microbes, but civilizations. And of the 24,000 people, and this is the largest study of its kind, you know, that covered a lot of different countries, different regions, different cultural beliefs, different religions, so that the people that they were asking these questions of were a reasonable map of the diversity of humanity, not just, you know, uh, a bunch of New Age people in the San Francisco Bay Area, right? This was far more diverse and larger than that. So they asked them that first question, and 60% of those responding said, yes, we do believe there's civilizations out there. Okay, cool. The, the follow-on question to that, to that was, um, should we be interacting and communicating with these civilizations? And 40% said yes. Now, you can, there's a no part where a bunch of others said no to this, and that's not the point I'm trying to make. That's, um, that's the people who maybe don't believe or are afraid of making contact, whatever. I'm concentrating on the yes, the positive answers, the 60% of the first question and then 40% of that. I took those statistics and extrapolated them. You know, I have a computer science math background. I love numbers. And I thought to myself, okay, this is one small study done very scientifically. Um, How can I extrapolate that to see what the numbers are like all around the world? There's 7.6 billion people at that time on the planet. How many of them really believe there are ET civilizations and we should be interacting? So I used those basic percentages from that study, extrapolated the numbers, and I came up with 1.3 billion people today on the planet, which is a a huge chunk of humanity, believes there are ET civilizations and we should be interacting with them. These are the people that are our natural allies and in theory support the CE5 protocol and the ET contact that we're making. Now, I hasten to add that probably half of those people, like half of humanity, is starving. They're not really looking up at the skies. They may have this belief, but they're worrying about where their next meal is going to come from, sure. you know, feeding their families. And, and yet, though, even a small percentage of those um, are people that can be taught. So that's why we're growing our community in the People's Disclosure Movement, because I now know that there's 1.3 billion people that are kind of on our side, and that just blew me away. I had no idea it was that large. But go to some party anytime and get people in a private (laughs) setting and ask them if they've seen this or know someone that they've seen a UFO. There's more of that than you think there is. Yeah, I was just fixing to ask you that. Or like if you go out in public, uh, and since this stuff is on your mind quite a bit, which I'm sure it is because it's on mine too, if you just hear somebody, uh, I've actually heard somebody say things like, did you see that thing in the sky the other night? It was really weird. And I want to go over there and go, hey, and just start a conversation with them. But sometimes I think, you know, they might judge me or something or think that I'm crazy uh, because Mm -hmm. they're just questioning what it was, you know. Yeah. It, and the, and that's the call everybody has to make, right? We're we're social creatures and we want to share, right? Sure. But we also don't don't want to be put down and thought crazy. So that's it's a powerful question that causes you to confront your own courage, your own fears. And I'm in I'm in no judgment of people who say I can't speak up in my family. They write to me and they say I am so glad I found this community. I can't talk about this in my family. They'll try to commit me. Um, those that have heard about it aren't talking to me. 
and my wife will divorce me, or my husband will, whatever. And I have so much um, empathy for that. It's not my situation, but I hear enough of it that I realize it's a very real thing. When you decide to open your mouth and talk, you are taking some risks. Now, the 1.3 billion people I mentioned shows me that there's a lot of uh, a larger, friendlier audience out there than any of us ever thought possible. So your odds have improved um, over what they were maybe decades ago. But still, that's a fundamental thing that someone has to ask themselves. When I go to parties here, parties here in the in the area. And people ask me, um, I just say, you know, what do you do? Who are you? And you're just cocktail party, social chatter, right? I say, well, you know, I was in in a software engineering business for 40 years, almost 40 years. But now I have a community that teaches people how to make contact with extraterrestrial beings. And here's the website. And here's what we've been doing for a few years. And honestly, uh, I get very few people rolling their eyes. Usually, and especially if they're younger, like millennials, their eyes get big and wide and they say, can you teach me how to do that? Or people will say, I had an experience, or I know someone who did, and then they tell you their story. And that's what's amazing, is there's a lot more openness than I than I, I thought. So it's getting better. It's Or it's at least it better. seems that way. Yeah, it's got, no, it has gotten better. Uh, keep in mind, when I... Um, when I was a kid, Star Trek, I don't know how old you are, but when this, the first series came on, that was a, a big deal. Uh, Gene Roddenberry did such a great service. Everybody to watched Star Trek. Everybody that, watched it. Everybody did, right? Yeah. My dad watched it. You know, William Shatner, Spock. I watched it with him when I was a kid. And I'm like, yeah. why does my dad watch Westerns, you know, the Pink Panther, all this other... but. He makes sure that he watches Star Trek every day. <laughs> really weird. I know. You know? Well, since Star Trek, that opened up a lot of minds. Um, and then we had, uh, you know, Star Wars. We had the movie E.T., Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The positive portrayals. Of course, there's always been Hollywood movies of they're, they're invading us and they're going to eat us. Let's fight back. Those, unfortunately, are in the majority. But there have been enough positive shows and movies that have ignited the, the imagination of people everywhere in all countries, like E.T. or like Close Encounters, that have um, inspired people. And that has changed attitudes for the better. Uh, especially, I have a lot of hope for millennials. They're going to, and the generation after them, I've forgotten what label they're labeling that now, but um, these are the young people who are far more open than when you and I grew up because these movies have come along and opened their minds. So now they're starting at a higher base level. They're the ones who are saying, can you teach me how, rather than, oh, oh, that's nice, and then they change the subject and walk away. <laughs> right. 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 So there's a lot of hope there, and I, I really especially want to welcome younger people uh, to the website, to etletstalk.com. By the way, membership is free there. We have people's reports of what they've seen. They've put videos up there, pictures, all kinds of things. Right. All and, right. Well, um, we we got to take our, uh, a break here, but that's uh, etletstalk.com. I know a lot of you in the chat room have actually been visiting the website. We'll be right back with Costa McCreese. You guys don't go anywhere right after these words. The Fringe FM. All right, everyone. This is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into the Fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, me old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your north and south and use your 10 speed gears and listen to them bubble. You could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussel, but he ain't no holy fryer. Anyway, you beat a Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. 
Hey, Fringe FM listeners. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or Internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS app store. Poor water quality is a major health issue, and it's only getting worse. Municipalities can't keep up, standards have dropped, and pollutants are increasing. Where does it all end? It ends by keeping the pollutants outside of your home with HydroCare's advanced systems available at Wave Home Solutions. No less than the best purification materials and processes have been developed by HydroCare to provide you with healthy, clean water for drinking, cooking, and showering. HydroCare far surpasses the competition in removing chlorine, odors, iron, lead, chemicals, lime scale, and much more. Don't settle for less when it comes to your water. We'll take care of the toughest water problems for you, whether it's from a city or well source. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, call 888-997-WAVE. That's 888-997-WAVE. Or go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Solutions for a healthy, comfortable home. Greetings, galactic community. This is Suzanne Ross, host of Sci Spy Radio, every Wednesday evening from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific. Join me for this brand new show featuring a revolutionary new genre, size by merging science and spirituality to give us answers to the greatest mysteries of creation. Together, scientific discovery and spiritual revelation reveal the truth about who we are, where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. Tune in to Sci Spy Radio every Wednesday from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific and discover the truth for yourself at thefringe.fm. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. Follow the Fringe FM on Facebook and Twitter at the Fringe FM. Times are changing. The circus of politics, healthcare's low standards, and high prices. And let's not forget food quality. What to do? Arm yourself with Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. In a world of chemical imbalance and poor air and water quality, it's time you make a move. Log on to GetTheTea.com and stock up on organic non-GMO supplements. Don't forget the tea. Cleansing your body never felt so good. And we have a brand new tea called Takedown Tea, which helps support healthy glucose. All natural body support so you can be at your best, naturally. All you have to do is log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. We're not a fad that comes and goes. We are the real deal. Join us and armor up. GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Changing America's health one tea bag at a time. The Friends FM loves hearing from you. Have a suggestion, comment, or question? We're all ears. Email talkback at thefriends.fm. Want to know what's on the Friends FM? Check out our schedule at thefriends.fm. Thank you. 
Costa McCreese is our guest. The website is etletstalk.com. Don't forget, if you enjoy the show, you can always support the show by donating at lightingtheboy.com. You can use the Amazon portal, grab a t-shirt, or go to audibletrial.com forward slash LTV radio. Fascinating conversation we've had so far. Also, Dan Lopez is here with me. He's been awful quiet, but I can totally understand why some of these stories of are fascinating that you've been telling us. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the CE5 protocols, but first I had a just a quick question about something. Um, you know, in October, I've kind of dedicated myself, and hopefully I'll be able to do it, uh, to go to Mount Shasta. And mm-hmm. I heard you bring up Mount Shasta earlier, and I'm just wondering uh, if you have your own story about that place, because it seems like a very special place uh, for experiences for contact all, all that is true and it, it's always had that reputation um uh, some people believe and some claim to have gone to um um underground ufo bases there inside the mountain not necessarily physical but interdimensional so you'll hear a lot of a lot of stories um and we ourselves have the multiple times we've gone there to do our et contact We've seen lights and ships just shooting out of the mountaintop, going into it, hovering up at 12,000-foot levels where, you know, nobody should be and moving around as lights and things like that. So, uh, and, and actually, uh, last year we had someone in, in broad daylight look at the, the top of the mountain and actually saw a disc, a silver disc just floating across the top, you know, just like fully formed. It wasn't a light. It was physical looking in broad daylight for a few seconds and then it disappeared so yeah go with some good expectations maybe you can try the protocols when you're there joe and and see what happens for you yeah i definitely will can you talk to us about the protocols what the what are the uh ce5 et contact protocols what do they consist of Okay, uh, there's no real mystery. There's, uh, they're, they're, they're on the website, uh, C5 Protocol. You can click the link. It's a series of, of seven simple steps, very direct. And I have to say that at the core of them, all that's really required is one's ability to, to be still, to still the mind, to still the emotions, and to have an open, loving attitude of welcome and goodwill and good intention, positive intention. That's what we call raising the frequency, raising the vibration, so that the civilizations that are uh, visiting us here, our elder brothers, sisters, and cousins, they can detect us. You know, they have spiritual technologies, not just machine technologies, material. And they can detect um, us when we're in that state, and they can more easily communicate with us that way. So the protocols are all about uh, getting yourself still, and you go from steps one through seven. They involve some visualization. You don't have to be um, a years, a many years long meditator or a guru or, or anything like that. If you're just able to still your mind as much as you can and your thoughts and sit comfortably and then use your imagination and open your heart, you can follow the steps where you connect with the other members of your group who might be there with you. Uh, you do a lot of visualization. You visualize energy going from heart to heart in a circle, and then you visualize the energy of your group shooting out over the planet and linking up with all the other groups so that you form a network. And we are a community, and people have felt this community um, when we've done our monthly meditations for, for eight years now. So you, you do that, and then you send a beacon of love and light into the sky um, as, a, as a welcome, as an invitation. And then you imagine the star friends and star family responding to that and, and initiating the contact. So this involves um, just the ability to do a little bit of visualization, a little bit of imagination, and to, to have just a really pure intent. Not a big mystery. And I have to say that um, over the years that I've done this, people will take those seven steps and they, they add things. They may add certain tones, um, some music that they like in the background. Some people like to, um, to use tone, their own toning. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, people will modify stuff. And, you know, I'm not the CE5 police, so there's there's no way I could or would try to make everybody do it to the letter the way I describe it. But But I do ask people at the very core when they read what's there to understand that the spirit of this, again, is is being still, being loving, being open, connecting with your group, and using your imagination to connect with everybody else. We've been building a group field. You know, it's we're not doing this in isolation, really. When you connect with all the other groups on the planet, and we have 20,000 people in our community, and I know there's more in other communities that, that, that are added to that, but when you do this, you're not in isolation. You're connecting to all those others, and we're really presenting ourselves as... Um, cosmic humans you know we're showing the ets there that yeah there's a bunch of us here who are very consciously and willingly wanting to make contact with you all um we're not here to shoot at you or put you down or be afraid of you we're looking at you as our as our cosmic neighbors we're ready to become cosmic humanity i truly believe that in the years to come especially like i was talking before about the millennial generation that there will be thousands more people following in the footsteps of what our groups are doing now. So I look at us as, as being the vanguard um, and, and breaching this communication. Although there are groups that started this in the 70s, like the, the, the Rama group, but they were very underground in the Latin world. And they're still very active and they've been very successful. Um, since the 90s, though, a lot of the groups, such as I'm talking about, who are using these protocols, have sprung up uh, by the thousands, and we're going to keep growing now. And so, again, this is a group mission. This is not Costa's mission or or anyone else's. It's it's all of ours. You know, it's our people's disclosure. And I I keep emphasizing that to people so that we really realize that if we're going to save things, if we're going to save this planet, it's going to be a group, and it's not going to be any one person with an ego who comes as a savior and and wants to have other people worship him or her because they're the only one who can do this. That's baloney. That's been tried. How's that worked for us? Right, very yeah. Well. Um, yeah I, so this is a group thing. I wonder about the people that are curious that, because I know there's minds out there that are curious about this, probably super skeptical, but there's also another part of their mind that's thinking, what if this is real? What would, what would you say to that person? Would you say, you know what? You know, you don't have to go out into a group. If you're worried about judgment or whatever and you're a skeptic, maybe, like I'm thinking about doing, maybe go out into somewhere by yourself first and try it and see if something happens, yeah. you know? Yeah, I would recommend that. And and I, I do have to differentiate between some, between um, being skeptical, which I would call skeptical, open-minded, and, and having the heart of a skeptic. If you're someone who has really the heart of a skeptic, this is not going to work for you. If you're someone who's skeptical but open-minded and willing to experiment and to uh, break into something new, if new uh, data comes along, that that's open-mindedness. That's fine because I think a lot more people are there, and I think these protocols will work. And I have to say that everybody's different. Sometimes people come along, they learn the protocols, and they get right back to me and they say, this worked the first time. Oh, my God. My family and I went out, and this happened, right? And other people say, you know, I've tried this a few times. It doesn't work yet. And I kept saying, um, you know, be patient. Eventually they would come back and say, I've had my first experience. Um, So I can't guarantee anything. Sure. But you do have the power to have that open mind, and that much you do have power over. And um, because these civilizations are so eager to find peaceful human beings, I think the odds are way better that you are going to have some kind of contact. And again, you have to look forward in different ways. It may not always be that light in the sky. We've had, I've had, and others have, our our smartphones that were powered off. Suddenly, after we do one of these meditations, they'll just power on by themselves. And like in my case, it went and they played a song from my playlist that was about the stars, something cosmic. Oh, cool. And the song just came in playing like I hadn't touched it. It just lit up and then blah, 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 it's playing. You know, 
that doesn't happen randomly. Uh, the contact happens in a lot of different ways. I've been touched on the shoulder when no one was there or on the knee. Um, I've had telepathic messages come in a lot of different ways, and so have other people. So I, I tell people, uh, be open-minded how the contact can come and be ready for it to come in creative ways that might delight you. Yeah, I've, I've, so far everybody that I know that's attempted this, um, Kevin Estrella, John Polk, a few other people that I know have told me that that they've had experiences with it. And when you say it comes in many different ways, for instance, like if I went out and did a visualization and meditation, from my understanding, it could come back even later or days later sometimes. Yeah, it could, yes. That's yeah, odd. That's I wonder why that is. Who knows what what parameters go in are in effect when they make contact? Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, one thing I tell people is that I, I don't know everything. I'm 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 an expert on the experience I've had and the things that I've learned from people that I trust, but I'm sure not an expert in in every answer and knowing. Sure all of this. So that's my disclaimer. I'm just experimenting like everyone else. Well, it ta- definitely sounds to me like you've had an experience and that you've been, I don't want to say chasing it because that sounds kind of bad, but in my mind, that's exactly because I have to, I have a, a curious addictive nature. So, <laughs> I mean, in my <laughs> mind, that's exactly what I would be doing, you know? And if I'm wondering if you could have like my perfect thing would be to do this and to have them either show up via a ship or show up right in front of me and communicate with me. And to me, that may be a little extreme based on a touch or something, but that's what I would be aiming for. You know, that's what I'd want to have. Would that be your idea of the ultimate contact? Cause you've, yeah. I mean, your wife has had that contact, right? Yeah. She's had that. Right. And other people I know in the community have had that as well. And what I hear from a lot of people like yourself is that very same thing. is like, I want to sit down at a table and let's have tea together. Yeah, right. Um, My wife says I want to dance with them. You know, she's a a dancer. So (laughs) um, what you're you're stating there, Joe, is very natural and normal. Um, And it happens to some and to many others it hasn't happened yet. And I sure don't know why, what's operating. There's, um, there's just a lot going on that we don't know about, which um, would explain maybe why does one person have this kind of success and another one is, is wanting it but doesn't have it. We don't have the answers yet. But, you know, that doesn't stop us from trying. Um, sure. And certainly if you don't try, it may never happen. So go out, do that, and you might be surprised someday when, you you have a physical meeting. I know people who've had physical meetings, not only my wife, but who've walked with uh, our star friends and communicated and worked with them. Right. So how can people uh, join the, the community? They just go to the website and sign up, yeah. and that's yeah, all they, they got to do? Yeah, just um, give your name and your email address. Uh, the membership is free, and I will respond with um, uh, a welcome letter and... Uh, a personal response, and I like to ask uh, answer questions that people might have, but I hope at least that people look around on the website and they go to the the community map to find others near them. And you know what? Here's uh, one thing I do want to say: when people do go to the map, you know we're not as big as I, I want to be now, so chances are a lot of people will not find someone in their town or next door. Mm-hmm. But that shouldn't stop people from contacting others on that map. Because, and this has happened multiple times, um, someone that you might contact like halfway around the world or on the other side of the country just to get to know them and say, hey, hi, neighbor, how long have you been doing this? You know, just uh, know each other, even though you may never physically meet. In that conversation you have with people far away, they may know somebody, to your delight and surprise, who lives next door to you. Or in your or in your town, let's say, who does this or is interested, and then they can put you in touch with them. Like I say, that's happened. So it's really worthwhile doing some proactive um, networking uh, when you go on this map 
and just starting conversations with people. Because, like I said, you never know when you might know someone that it lives next door to them that hooks them up or vice versa. It can be fun. Now, do you try to, do you offer retreats where, like events where a lot of people can go? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, three times a year in Bloomington, Indiana, in the Midwest, in uh, Northern California at Mount Shasta, which we've been talking about a lot, mm-hmm. and in the Southern California desert in the uh, Joshua Tree National Park area. Uh, we get about 15 to 20 people. We spend six days and nights together. During the afternoons, uh, people get lessons in psychic development, how to discover their own psychic senses uh, from uh, my wife, Hollis Polk, who's um, a professional uh, clairvoyant. And that way people learn how to extend their senses so that they can maybe have better contact. In the evenings, we go off for several hours as a group. We do the protocols, and we do the sky watch that night. And uh, people bond during the week. Um, I always leave a lot of free time for people. I like to, to to have balance so that we're not running them ragged from morning till night. There's plenty of time during the, the, the week of the retreat for people to go off and recreate on their own. These areas that we go to have the uh, ability for people to, to swim, to bike, to hike, uh, go shopping, you know, whatever, get, get sleep, so that it balances um, uh, the active parts of the retreat. And I just think that's a, a whole lot better to do that. A lot of us have gone to conferences where they, uh, like I say, they run you ragged from morning to night, and after four or five days of this, you're a mess. <laughs> yeah, it just everything and, happens so fast, and it's all at once, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you're on overload. And I like to pace this better. Uh, we've been doing these retreats for four years now, and if people become members on the website, they'll get announcements. Uh, about the, um, how to register, and I keep them very affordable, very low cost, um, so that um, everyday people uh, can experience this. And really, it, it's my joy to watch a group come together. Some of some of whom come back year after year, and they they meet each other again, and they're old friends, and they're happy to see each other. And then there's new people that come in, and they're kind of questioning, but they're curious in the way that you are and that you've expressed. And by the end of the week, they're like best buddies with everybody, and we keep an email thread going, and and et cetera, and we stay in touch. So it's it's a bonding experience, a cosmic bonding and a human bonding. Uh, what could be better, uh, yeah. other than winning the lottery, maybe? But. Right. <laughs> but it sounds great. I mean, I've always wanted to go to Joshua Tree uh, in Mount Shasta. I've heard a lot of people talk about the experiences of Joshua Tree. Do you think? Uh, Real quick, because I know we only got a few minutes left here with you. Are there really locations in your experience that are more prone to these types of things? Like they're energetic places that just have more activity. Yeah, I, I do believe there are. And Mount Shasta is one of those. Uh, Joshua Tree National Park area is another one of those. Uh, and there are others around the world. Um, I'm not a an expert in all those areas, uh, but I know here locally uh, people flock to these time and again because, uh, yeah, they, they have results, they get results. Another place is the East City Ranch up in Trout Lake in, in Washington. Mm-hmm. That's been there for many years, and um, the land there uh, always produces sightings. Yeah, I want to I wanna see something more than... Not to say that lights aren't really cool, because they are, especially if you see them moving in a way that you know that they're just not supposed to move or act. I mean, that is really cool. But I would like to experience something a little more than that. You know what I mean? Just to, I don't know why my brain needs that extra validation, but it does. Well, that's perfectly normal. Um, Many people are like you like, like that. They... And, you know, it, it, it's what's necessary. If we really want our visitors to come and become part of our lives, at some point we have to provide an earth where it's safe, where we're not killing each other, so that they can mingle with us and and talk and learn and teach each other, right? So right. you start with the lights in the sky. That gets people interested. 
but what you're stating is what's normal, which is eventually I want to meet your neighbor, you know, and shake your hand or, or whatever, give you a hug. Um, and believe me, they have technologies there, too, that uh, we are told can cure a lot of incurable diseases, cancers, etc. They have um, free energy that they're using that could remake this planet, uh, could end poverty and um, just provide us with free, limitless, non-polluting energy, you know, forever. And scientific marvels, whatever, the, the, the technologies, they're there and they want to share them. But like I've mentioned, we have to produce a, a better world that has that is more at peace, in my opinion, before we have a lot of full, open, large-scale contact. But it's coming. And the work that we're doing in our groups is is uh, preparing the soil for have, that. And have they communicated to you, point. Costa, that it's coming? With that? That it's coming, full disclosure, eventually. I, I think so, yes. And and we are it. I mean, think about it. When enough of us look at each other and go, you know, I don't need to see an announcement on TV because I've seen with my eyes, and you have too, and so has your cousin, and your friend in the town next door. That's the disclosure right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, look at the power we have, people power. Yeah. And when there's enough of us, we will tip those scales. And that's what my ET friends told us in 2010. There will come a tipping point where so many people have seen and believed that you you can't put anything back in the bottle. You can never hide it again. Well, this is... Uh been an absolute pleasure having you on the show uh again it's etletstalk.com I'll, I'll put the links in the show notes too for anybody that listens or wants to go back and listen for the podcast archives as well and uh if you want to give out uh any future events you're doing or social your social media links fire away yeah i was basically start with etletstalk.com that uh will place you on my global email list and you'll get all the announcements. I do um, uh, s- some free webinars. Uh, of course, the retreats, so there will be announcements. And for the monthly Global CE5 initiative uh, virtual events that we've been doing for eight years, there will be announcements for those. So that's the central place, is etletstalk.com. Right on. Thank you so much for coming on Lighting the Void, Costa. That was, it's been fun. We'll have to do it again sometime. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Dan Lopez and I will be right back, guys. We're going to wrap up the week. The phone lines are open. Costa McCreese, etletstalk.com. Make sure you go check out the website. We'll be right back. the void because it's interactive radio with good content interesting guests and a humble host sharing his journey through the esoteric hey joe roop thanks for having us along for the ride thank you so much for a delightful evening well i got a lot of ground to cover hi this is aaron hunter host of real paranormal activity the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world and we also conduct interviews with authors investigators psychics and mediums real people real stories real fear thursdays at 6 p.m pacific 9 p.m eastern on the fringe fm 
See you then. Hey, Fringe FM listeners. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or Internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. Follow The Fringe FM on Facebook and Twitter at The Fringe FM. Start your evenings with The Fringe FM long before those other shows get started. Exclusively live on The Fringe FM, hear the Quantum Hologram Matrix with the Reverend John Polk, Tuesdays at 5 Pacific, 8 Eastern. And our newest show, Psy Spy Radio with Suzanne Ross, Wednesdays at 5 Pacific, 8 Eastern. Then stay up because we're burning the midnight oil well into the morning hour. The truth is out there. And And so so are we. Lock it in. The Fringe FM. From Studio 303, it's the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on The Fringe FM. Bringing light to the stories that surround us. A Scottsdale, Arizona couple are scratching their heads after two mysterious objects fell from the sky and hit their cars early last Friday morning. Randy and Mary Long were driving in separate vehicles south along Scottsdale Road near the Loop 101 around 6.15 a.m. Friday when both their cars were hit by some sort of object. There was an explosion, said Randy Long. The glass roof of his Mercedes shattered when the object hit it. The two say they were traveling about 100 yards apart without any vehicles or pedestrians nearby. Scottsdale Police Department say they did not receive any calls for potential rock throwers either. All of a sudden, I heard a loud bang, said Mary. Her Lexus feared a bit better, receiving only a chip in the windshield. The two think a meteorite could be to blame. The story was posted at BendedReality.com. And a Colombian town enforces a curfew to protect young people from evil spirits spreading through WhatsApp. The mayor of a town in northern Colombia recently announced a curfew forbidding the transient and gathering of minors under the age of 17 in public places between 7 in the evening and 5 in the morning to protect them from evil spirits that have allegedly been spreading through the popular messaging app WhatsApp. Since the beginning of the week, authorities in the Catholic town have reported at least 14 cases of teenagers exhibiting strange behavior, including threats of jumping off bridges, self-lacerations, convulsions, fainting, and unexplained changes in their voices. This story was reported at OddityCentral.com. And another black-winged humanoid observed near Rockford, Illinois. The witness is quoted as saying, I was standing on the deck in my backyard late one summer evening. It was August of 2004. I was stargazing, as I often do, when I was startled by the sudden furious barking of the neighbor's dogs. As I turned and looked towards the direction of the barking dogs, it was at that moment I saw an all-black, seven-foot-in-length man with huge bat-like wings flying across the park that borders along my backyard. It then descended to approximately five to six feet above the ground. It pulled or folded its wings in slightly and then glided along the paved path that runs through the park. It continued gliding through the easement between the two houses, disappearing from my sight. This story is posted at phantomsandmonsters.com. And time for this edition's fun fact. 
The blob of toothpaste that sits on your toothbrush actually has a name. It's called a nurdle. And that wraps it up for another edition of the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on the Fringe FM. I'm Vance Nesbitt, anchor and news sorcerer. Welcome back to Lighting the Void. Pretty fascinating interview with Costa McCrees there. So we have started down the path of contacting ETs. We have talked about the three main initiatives here at Lighting the Void. The out-of-body experience, magic and the occult, and contacting ETs. We're on our way. Dan is here. Dan, you were awfully quiet during the interview. Phone lines are open too, by the way, 1-800-588-0335. If you've had an experience using the CE5 protocol, or if you got any comments or statements about that, call in, text in to 501-777-5631 is the text in number. You can also email the show at contact at lightingthevoid.com. Yeah, that's the first time I ever heard you, uh, well... I don't know. I was kind of that way too during the show, man. He he's very compelling. I I I got to say that I'm convinced, you know, about the CE five thing. I've I got to do it now for sure. I thought the flow of the conversation was very soothing, and so I just wanted to listen. <laughs> I I'd never spoken to him personally, so I I wanted to hear his story. I'm not one of those people who needed who needs confirmation. You know, I'm an experiencer and stuff like that. And I was sitting, I was saying that I was one of the people in the, I'm like one of those sub guests in the green room who just keep the guests, you know, uh, company while we're, while we're off the air. While you're on break. But, um, yeah, while we're on break and stuff like that. And I get to talk to them. So, but, you know, and during the show, it's just like, yeah, go, man, go. Say what's going on and everything like that. I know there were questions in the chat room we wanted to spring in. But I was, I really wanted to get his story and let it lay out there and, and let everybody get a full scope of what was going on. Because I know you had tons of questions already. Yeah. And it I, was just I, moving along well. I had a lot of more questions I wanted to ask him, to be honest. But he has some, I don't know. He's got an art of telling a story that I want to hear the rest of it. You know, so, uh, Yeah. I'm glad that I talked to the guy. I really am because now uh, I've finally got somewhere to start with this. You know, I've got Sue's book. I've got his community I can contact and hopefully I can find somebody out here. But if not, you know, he was talking about they have a virtual community too. But uh, I I do want to discuss this a little bit because you know how he was talking about visualizations when you... you, Let's just say you're an average Joe and you, some guy tells you, hey, through this, uh, you know, CE5 protocols, you know, I can contact aliens. Well, the first thing you're going to think is, well, do you got some type of instrument or language that you use or something special? And no, he didn't say that at all. What he said was it's there's no mystery to it. You just use, you know, focus, meditation, visualization and imagination. Right. And then you. You know, I think uh, Don was saying in the speaker chat that you open your heart and it's not what I thought it was. But the more he talked about it, I got to thinking, what about all the people that said that they've had contact, even in the occult, like Aleister Crowley, uh, Grant Morrison, people like this, magicians, what do they use? Visualization. That's the biggest tool a magician has. Is his ability to focus and visualize. I can't even say visualize things. can't say that word for some reason. But that's the biggest tool they have. So it does make you wonder uh, about the power of the mind and what it really is sometimes. It does for me anyhow. 
Yep, absolutely. Uh, imagination, visualization, <clears throat> the power of focus. I don't, well, it would seem funny because you were had spoken about this earlier this week. How you have, how you had uh, problems with that with your ADD and stuff like that, and mm -hmm. how it's hard for you to focus and stuff like that. So it's just another thing you might want to apply towards. Yeah, the one especially thing that, if you're going to go to Shasta. I'm sorry. Go right. Ahead. Well, no, I don't know. You're right. I mean, the one thing that I. Uh, I need to practice on that before I go out there. The one thing that did help me was the the beginning Golden Dawn exercises of focus, the breathing exercises that they have, and mm -hmm. and I gotta say, Robert Monroe's first audios, where he does the hemi sync and the binaural stuff, and he's talking to you in your ear. I mean, he just has a way, kind of like uh, Costa does, just has a way of that kind of Absolutely. voice that yeah they can just get you right there in the moment you know guided and it's weird cuz i can take i've never been more relaxed in my life after i've listened to one of uh hemi sinks one of the original ones and i don't I haven't listened to a lot of the new ones i'm sure they're just as good mm -hmm. but i've never been that relaxed and focused in my life so it makes me wonder, hey, do we really need this type of medication and Adderall and all this stuff, or do we just need to practice more, you know? We totally need to practice more. But I know my audience, too. There's a lot of skeptics. And if you're skeptical, I'm convinced about this because I guess I could say a few of the reasons would be I just brought up one. How some of the magicians, even that that write in their books, once they got into these mantras and visualizations, they would make contact with beings. I know Crowley made contact with a being called Lamb or something, even drew a picture of him. Grant Morrison is a chaos magician, said he went to Kathmandu to, to meet aliens, and he did. And then there's other books where they talk about it, and I know that that's what they're doing. They're using their their focus and visualization but another thing that, that I thought about, Dan, is do you remember, I know you know who Daniel Joseph is. I've had him on here. He's a student of um, Doskalos, or Dr. Stylianus Ateshlis, one of the greatest mystics that ever lived, Christian mystic from the island of Cyprus. And I remember, I think it was the second or third time that he was on this show. And I asked him, I said, uh, Daniel, have you ever contacted beings that were from like aliens from another world. I don't even know why I asked him that. And he was really hesitant. It's not something that he wanted to talk about because that wasn't his message and he didn't really, it wasn't practical to him at the time. But he said yes. And I know he's not going to lie to me about anything. And I did ask him during the break and I don't really have to have to or want to talk about why he didn't want to talk about it. But he he hesitated. He said, yes, I have. And that's all he said. And that was one of the bigger moments for me, too, that I th really figured that this thing was real, you know. I want to hear, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. hear about your <laughs> experience, though. Which one? The one in Puerto Rico? Any one of them, because I don't know. If, I didn't know <laughs> that you were an experiencer. I mean, I know you had your own experiences oh, yeah. with the spiritual stuff, but I didn't know about this. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've I've mentioned it a few times. I think people know about the one in Puerto Rico where I saw it. And I told my uncle, I told my uncle that I had seen that I was seeing something and that maybe he should come out of the house to, to let me know what the heck it is, because I couldn't I couldn't make sense of it because it was about 100 feet away or more. It was a golden orb. And we have a, it was a farm across the across the road. And uh and so this thing is moving really slow. It's got to be maybe about 20, between 25 and 50 feet off the ground. And it's moving really slow and none of the field is being disturbed, but it's just moving across. And I thought it was a crop duster, but there was no dusting underneath it. And uh, <laughs> it's just rolling along. No noise, no nothing. And I'm like, this is very weird. So I call out to my uncle and I tell him, you know, 
what what the hell is this? He's like, oh, UFO. <laughs> I'm like, UFO. okay, I get that. I get that. I get, I got it because I had, because when I was seven or so, my, my father had brought home the books on Are We Alone and, or We Are Not Alone, one or, and um, Chariots of the Gods by Donakin. So, <clears throat> So I was not, I was not, um, how you might say, alien <laughs> to the whole concept of aliens. And so I kind of got it and I was like, all right, so that's what that is. What else is going on? So it takes off and gets down about a quarter of a mile, does a 40, 45 degree bank upwards. And then it just goes in a zigzag pattern and out of, out of, just out of sight. And at that point, I was like, "That was the coolest thing I've ever seen." <laughs> and you're you're in so, after that. That's all it takes. Oh, after it? that, I was yeah. After that, that was it. That was it for me. I was like, I knew that there's just more going on than anybody's being told. Period. So, but I was also telling you about the time where it was it was weird that you know, I guess that. Um, I can I can still see things that are that are undescribable. Like when we were going up to Toledo, me and my little one were going up to Toledo to meet up with um, with Heather and family. And uh, so as we're going up there, there's this red orb in the sky, and it's flickering on and off, and and you know it's just you couldn't really describe or deny that this was like not something it wasn't a plane it wasn't coming forward it wasn't going away it wasn't going side to side or anything it was just sitting there just sitting there but it was flickering right mm -hmm. so then it's flickering to the point where it starts getting more and more intense and then out just it just flashed out so i get over to heather's <clears throat> we have uh we have our little our uh, little, little soiree, and uh, then we're going to go run out to the lake to our campground that we were going to. And I had told Heather what was going on, what we saw on the way up there. We get up to the lake. Sure enough, in the same kind of direction in, in the sky is this red flickering orb. <laughs> and it's doing the same thing. I'm like, Heather, that's what we saw. <laughs> And she's like, get out of here. And sure enough, it just started flickering, flickering. And then I think we were looking at it for like maybe five minutes. Flickering, flickering. And then it got brighter and brighter. And then, poof, gone. That's so, so cool, it was, man. You know what that I'm saying? That it's like it's really weird that you're able to not only to witness something like this, but be able to show somebody else. And I was like, this is this is really intense. But it was what was what I thought was cool too, which I had never seen ever ever in my entire life, was when um, we were hanging out. We had a campfire at the same lake, and as we're sitting there, I'm looking at the skies as we always do, and it was a good night, you know, because a lot of times it's mostly overcast and stuff like that up in Michigan. So. <clears throat> nice clear night. You could see the stars and everything like that. You, you could see like clusters of stars. Yeah. So I'm looking up one. at one. Yeah. And so I'm looking up at one cluster of stars and I'm like, there's, there's activity. Now I can't tell if this activity is like the atmosphere refracting the light from the stars or whatever, but it looks like lines, lines just shooting from star system to star system. And I'm like, and it's in a little, it's in a little, cluster by itself but it was almost undeniable that there's something going on there that i don't know what the hell is going on so i said well let me not say nothing and i'll just and i'll just ask them and so i, I went over to dan and, and heather and i was like come here take a look up straight up and tell me what you see and they described the same thing they saw lines they saw lines shooting back and forth from the stars as if it was like either communication or it was a big traffic jam. <laughs> you hear a lot of people like, talk like, about wars, too. I've heard war. people talk about how they saw wars going on in the sky. I, for a long time, I thought that's why they were actually spraying the skies because they didn't want you to see what was going on up there. And that's why you hear about all of these 
big glowing things th- that are in the skies that you know people cannot explain mm-hmm. like it just stays there and there's big flashes of light and then there's booms that you can't uh you can't describe and stuff like that and they don't know if it's coming from above or below but i for a long time i there's there's been a cosmic war going on and nobody wants to talk about it and but there's a few conversations you know spreading around in that but you got to you got to be, you know, you got to take what sounds right, you know, and resonates in your heart and then, you know, leave the rest because the rest is fiction. Well, it's it's so. way past the point of conspiracy as far as spraying the skies now, you know, they're, mm-hmm. uh, oh, yeah. they talked about it today and the scientists are saying, oh, by the way, uh, yeah, yeah, if yeah. we spray chemicals the into the atmosphere, <laughs> you know, we could slow global warming down by reflecting the sunlight back into space. And they're still trying to play this game as if they're just now figuring this out, like they hadn't already been doing it, you know. Exactly. But uh, one thing I did want to ask him is I didn't get to it, and I had it start here on my notes, was to ask him about our solar system. Because... You hear all these conspiracy uh, theories about the moon and the, the beings on our planets like Venus. Even Samuel on Vior talks about that we have beings on the planets in our solar system, which I find hard to believe. I'm sorry. I do. And the reason why I find that hard to believe, it's just my mind, but it's based on a lot of the, the evidence that we have Uh how could these planets be inhabitable? It's just hard for me to grasp. Well, I guess what he was saying is some of the beings are interdimensional, and some of these planets actually have beings that live, you know, below the Earth, like inner Earth type stuff, maybe on Mars. But you know what I mean. And I wanted yeah. to ask him if that had ever happened, because you always hear about these other star systems and Arcturus and the Pleiades and all of this stuff. Well, what about here? I mean, are we the only planet that's got beings on it? Uh, I guess we'll find out sooner or later. But now I'm jealous, Dan. I want to have the same experiences. I've only saw one orb in my lifetime, and I don't. I still don't know today if it wasn't an optical illusion. But yours definitely was. I can tell by how excited you are, or you are, that it was no optical illusion. Nah. No, I don't. It is what it is, Joe. I don't. Uh, there's nothing. Yeah, there's no way to to take that away. From yeah. Me. Yeah. No. <laughs> I get that, man. No. I do. Just like last night, we had some phone callers call in uh, Mike and uh, someone text in about Preston's story about the out of body experience. And I understand. Please. I, if you guys call in and want to get proof from one of my guests by all means do it i'm there most of them are so used to that uh Mm. you're not gonna offend them and they a lot of them know that what they're saying is is wild you know to the to the average mind it's a wild thing but the funny thing is is everybody's entire perception of what's real and what's not real changes in one experience, I think we forget about that. How one experience will change everything, and I've had that one experience with the out of body experience. I've had it with magic. I just haven't had it with um, aliens and ET contact and all that. But I'm betting sometime within the next few months, you're going to hear me screaming. I saw one. I met one. I talked to one. I don't know. We'll see, but I'm definitely going to try it. Were you doing this stuff, by the way, Dan, the C5 stuff, or did this just happen to you? Just happened. No protocols. No I mean, I always no. look up. Nah, you don't meditate when you're driving. <laughs> That's not what I've been hearing. Everybody's like, you can meditate when you walk or when you drive. I'm like, why in the hell would you want to do that? Uh, yeah, you can when you're walking, but I wouldn't do it when you're driving. Definitely not. It's, there's, a, there's bad enough. It's bad enough. You can go into your own world and and you go on autopilot when you're driving, and that's that that can take you into weird places. 
That's where you start making turns. You ever do that? You ever do that, Joe? You ever get behind the wheel and wind up going into a zone and you're like, how yeah. the hell did I wind up in this neighborhood? Yeah, some people, the, the I think some people call it, drove it missing time, yeah. but I know I've been there. Oh, I don't know about missing time, but I know about freaking winding up someplace I didn't expect to. I was like, how did I wind up here? <laughs> the car just drove itself. Yeah, you entered some the same kind of zone that you do when you play video games, I think. And you just get in that. Those long stretches out in the West, I mean, they just do that to you. Oh, boy. I told you that Should time I went out to Death Valley and I freaked out and turned around. That's exactly yeah. what happened to me. I was driving at night through Death Valley all by myself. Uh, as soon as the cell phone signal sh- uh, cut out, I figured, ah, I'll just keep going. Nothing to be afraid of. You know, I'm perfectly safe. But uh, I did zone out for a while, but then my mind started playing tricks on me. And I had a fear in Las Vegas, fear and loathing in Las Vegas moment. I, you know, I started freaking out. Like, what the hell am I doing out here in the middle of the desert for no it's reason? Weird. You know, yeah. and, and uh, being that far away from everything and everybody, it just kind of freaked me out for a little bit. And I turned around, broke the speed limit on the way back, actually. And I'm a grown boy. I shouldn't be scared of stuff like that. It's kind of weird. I know there was one ter- there was one spot on the road when we were going out west um, that you're going you're going. It's a big, long, straight road. You can't see nothing but the horizon and and the road. And you're, the car is like choking. It's, it's freaking feeling it. But you look like you're going downhill. But <laughs> you're actually on an incline. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with the car? And sure enough, it was just, that's what it was. It's like the car is going uphill, but you're actually, but you look like you're going downhill. And, it, and it's forever because it took about six another 60 miles before we were going to hit another gas station or whatever. And it's like, oh, Lord, please help me. <laughs> I hope we make it. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine. You know, we only got uh, 30 more minutes left of this show. And for the week, uh, we do have to take our final break here. But uh, I do need to mention that uh, I wanted to thank Jan. also wanted to thank Barbara. Uh, I'm probably going to leave a few people out. Genevieve, um, quite a few of you have uh, helped support the show and the network this month, and you don't know how much I appreciate that. You don't know how much the network appreciates it. And the reason why Costa came on the show tonight is because in the Discord chat, there is a room there where you can put guests, you know, if you want certain guests to be on the show, you just put their name, and I promise you, I give you my word, that I will do everything in my power to get that guest on. And so we've built a nice little community here, and I really appreciate you guys. This is fun. But we'll be right back. we got a few more minutes left with you this week. Uh, and don't forget to call in numbers 1-800-588-0335 if you do want to call in. Toll free from the United States or Canada. Be right back. is out there. There's something out here. It's slow. KTOK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe FM. Hello, this is Vance Nesbitt. Take the time to expand your mind by listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop right here on The Fringe FM. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. All right, everyone, this is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into the fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, me old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your north and south and use your 10 speed gears and listen to them bubble. You could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussels, but he ain't no holy fryer. Anyway, you beat a Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. Poor water quality is a major health issue, and it's only getting worse. Municipalities can't keep up, standards have dropped, and pollutants are increasing. Where does it all end? 
It ends by keeping the pollutants outside of your home with HydroCare's advanced systems available at Wave Home Solutions. No less than the best purification materials and processes have been developed by HydroCare to provide you with healthy, clean water for drinking, cooking, and showering. HydroCare far surpasses the competition in removing chlorine, odors, iron, lead, chemicals, limescale, and much more. Don't settle for less when it comes to your water. We'll take care of the toughest water problems for you, whether it's from a city or well source. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, call 888-997-WAVE. That's 888-997-WAVE. Or go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Follow The Fringe FM on Facebook and Twitter at The Fringe FM. Want to know what's on The Fringe FM? Check out our schedule at thefringe.fm. You're listening to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at Yeah, I think consciousness plays a big role in all of this stuff, definitely. Uh, oh, yeah. Dan and I were talking during the break about psychedelics, uh, Justin and Paul's YouTube channel that they're working on. and that you know, guys looking from at the, the UK. Uh, p- pictures here and uh, the Fringe FM chat that uh, Linda put in there. Some of this stuff, you know, how they talk about meeting these beings when they're on different substances. And it makes me think about the the lines of reality, you know, like we think we're in reality, but we could take a psychedelic substance or, or something. And we may actually be peeking into what reality really is. You know what I mean? And we get, look, all of a sudden we see these beings that have been there the whole time, but we just, it's, I don't know. I'll try to figure out how to explain that in just a second, but we do have a call is 208 area code. They're on the air. Who are we speaking with? Hi, it's Linda Irwin. Hey, Linda. How are you? Oh, pretty good. I was so glad to hear Costa on. Maybe one of these days in the future you can get both Costa and Hollis on together. She's amazing, too. Yeah, it was you that recommended uh, Costa to come on the show, right? Right. Yeah, see, I am new, I'm- so you know that I'm new to this this uh, CE5 thing and uh, meeting beings but it sounds to me like you're not i'm looking at this picture here that you put in the uh the chat a visitor that showed up Uh in 2012 you couldn't get a photograph on Mm -hmm. him but remembered enough to sketch it out and it looks kind of like a gray was it a gray yes he called himself ampus a-m-p-u-s and he took over sort of working on my body at night when i tried to sleep and I'd have a lot of aches and pains in that. Well, one thing, I'm in I'm 61 now, going on 62, and some of that comes along with aging. But he's helped out a lot, and it feels like light static when he works on me. Oh, okay, and so he still he works on himself. you to this day. Yes. In fact, usually, okay, the CE Pfizer at the new moon, for some reason, they choose around the full moon to come to me and work on me. I'll be laying there trying to go to sleep, and all of a sudden I'll feel the tingling somewhere. (laughs) 
it's just like somebody rubs your hair with a balloon and then they touch you somewhere else. It's that kind of sensation. When was the first time that you met this being? The very first time. Ampus or others? Because I've been in contact since I was age eight. Yeah. So Different what? I, ones. Well, I would I would like to hear about the first, the very first time you met a being, what that was like. Even if you were eight, if you remember it. I don't remember much about eight. I just remember my mom woke me up in the middle of the night to look outside because there was this Christmas-colored light oval thing over the park behind our house. It was hovering there. And then I went, I don't know where I went. I just was aware that I wasn't at home anymore. And I did have missing time. Were you but scared? The first actual being, I no, not at all. Okay. But the first actual actual being that I saw was when I was nineteen, and I had just rented an apartment. I lived by myself, and I slept on a fold-out couch, and I put my alarm clock on the arm of the, the sofa part. And I remember waking up and seeing a man that looked humanoid, but the clothing had no seams to it. He was dark-haired. His features were sort of smooth, I guess you'd describe it, almost like you would expect a robot or an android trying to look human. And oh. he was sitting on the arm of that sofa, and he was watching me. And I was laying on my stomach, and I I got really freaked out. I thought, well, who are you? How did you get in there? I started to raise up. He put his hand on my left shoulder and simply said, it's all right. And without you know, my being able to resist, I was out. I was asleep. So, of course, when I woke up in the morning, I thought it was just a weird dream until I noticed that my alarm clock had been moved way away out of my reach onto the floor. So someone had been sitting there. So I got up and I looked around and I, how did somebody get in here? How did they? And I talked to my dad. Both of my parents were into the spiritual, metaphysical, paranormal. I was raised that way. And we decided that it had to be one of the beings. And later on, down the years, I would run into those types of beings again in my astrals. So that was pretty amazing, 19 years old, and to actually be face-to-face with one when I'm trying to sleep. So you do, uh, so everything that we talk about on the show, you pretty much are familiar with. The astral traveling, uh, meeting beings. Yes. What about the occult and magic yep. and stuff? Are you familiar with that, too? I actually dabbled in what they call witchcraft when I was in middle school, and I decided that was not for me. Uh-huh. I was actually trying to cast spells on that. And it came to me that don't do that. You know, don't try to control things and don't try to control people that way. Right, yeah. It's just not right. Yeah, that's but, what we so consider black magic or, or uh, baneful magic when you're trying to control uh, other people or situations that you know, you, that probably should be left alone. It's better to do it for yourself, but that's cool. So I'm glad. I'm actually very thankful that you recommended this guest because um, I'm pretty excited about this. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I know that I'm going to try to do this on my own first. Uh, just because I'm, I, may be, I may sound brave behind this microphone, but I'm kind of socially shy. I don't know if I'm ready to go to a group of people and try this yet. And honestly, Linda, I don't think I would give it my best focus if I was around a lot of people the first time. Well, you'd be surprised. Listen to the kind of music that you think feels, lifts you vibrationally, makes you higher. Mm -hmm. Because except for my mom, I mean, in my early years, I was pretty much alone. And I didn't even know what CE5 was. But here I was attracting them anyway. And so I just decided that if they're going to be in my life, I need to reach out to them and make regular contact. And that was before I even knew about ET Let's Talk. So, yeah, it's just a matter of being in the right space, being in the right mindset. Oftentimes you'll find the best way is to concentrate as you're getting ready to go to sleep if you're new to all this. Just envision yourself meeting with, you don't have to fill in a face or what the voice sounds like, but just envision that you're meeting with someone that's out there. And oftentimes, as you're drifting off to sleep, you may start dreaming or astraling, and you're actually doing it. 
Wow, that's really cool. Thanks for uh, calling in and sharing that with us, Linda. I know a little bit more about you now. <laughs> you belong right here in the fringe community. You're right at home. Yes, I am. I'm a fringer. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You guys Bye-bye. have a great night. You too. Bye. You too. Linda Irwin, everybody. I also wanted to thank uh, Kat and Barbara. Uh, Kevin, there's some people. I don't know who they are. I forget to, you know, I'm very appreciative of you guys' support and help in any way. And that that doesn't mean just money, you know what I mean? Some people support. I get letters from people. I get people that leave reviews uh, for the show on the Fringe FM and for the other hosts as well, like Ryan and Alex. And so we all appreciate you guys very much. And uh, as long as things stay the way they are, I know sometimes things get bumpy, but we're going to continue going down uh this road and try to grow this network a little bit but yeah that's cool linda's story is really cool see that makes me feel better but i just don't think i could go for some reason dan to a group of people and do it and and i'm just going to be totally honest with you i would worry that i would feel uncomfortable because when i go to i've been to a metaphysical conference before and mm, i don't want to offend anybody you yeah, have you ever been to a Pentecostal church, Dan, or Assembly of God or anything like that? Yeah. So it's kind of like the first time you go to one of those. Say you're a Baptist or whatever, and you go to a Pentecostal church. Right. And, you know, you think you're just going to bow your head and pray or something. And the next thing you know, somebody starts just going, la, 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 and flopping all over the place, right? Well, how am I supposed to focus on what I'm doing? while I'm feeling uncomfortable at that moment, right? So mm-hmm. you may so I've been to conferences or uh let's just say other places where of course we were all like minded, but the way that we did things was totally different. Um and it just kinda made me feel uncomfortable. So I think <laughs> that if I try this alone and I will tell you guys, you know, give you updates on what happens, that um Maybe I'll get more comfortable with it. <laughs> I don't know why I use that Pentecostal analogy, but that's the uncomfortableness that I'm afraid of, if that makes any sense. It was so funny because when you said that, I was picturing the story my daughter was telling me the other night. She was sharing with me, she said she went to a Healing Hands a healing hands um, um, session in a Christian thing. So she gets in there and they're like praying over her and whatever. And then they put, they put the push her forehead and she was like, well, I'm push back. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be pushing on me. <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? She's, and they're like, well, you're supposed to fall backwards. And she's like, I don't want to fall backwards. <laughs> <laughs> And it's so true because it's like, you know, you see these people and they're like, whoa, I was like, my, even my ex, my ex, she went out like, you know, holy smokes. I, I never seen her in that state before, but she was shaking and everything and she was out. And I was like, what the hell happened to you? Yeah. You watch some of these videos like, yeah, no. and you, you know, they're supposed to be casting out demons, but it looks to me like they let them all in, you know? Cause oh, I've yeah, seen him exactly. rolling and flopping on the floor and all kinds of stuff. And I'm thinking, if this is what heaven's like, I don't just give me a beer and put me in the corner. I don't oh. want to go there. You know, I don't know about heaven, but <laughs> it was kind of weird. <laughs> I don't know what you were saying, though. I can imagine Joe coming up there. Hi, my name is Joe, and I'm uh, <laughs> I'm experienced or challenged. Yeah, I'm not. Hi, Joe. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> hey, Joe. <laughs> well. I, uh, well, you know, I was talking earlier, we, we jump around so much and I don't care, but I'm getting somewhere with this, you know, the, the hermetic idea, the magicians talked about like all is mind, right? This is something they figured out way before quantum physics and quantum this or that science and all that. They, they figured this out through spiritual practice that they had a theory that the entire universe was just this one big mind and that it all came from one big thing of consciousness. But now we know about the, the, uh, double slit experiment. We know things change when they're observed or there has to be observation for there to be reality. 
particle or a wave, right? Yeah, so now we know that people are taking psychedelics like dimethyltryptamine, peyote, acid and stuff, and they're meeting, especially when they do dimethyltryptamine, they're meeting beings and all this other stuff. So what I'm thinking is, is this reality that we're living in now is probably some type of illusion. And most people are going to say, duh, but you don't know what the hell, you really don't know if it's an illusion or if it's really interdimensional or we really don't know if it's a big damn computer program. That's why I follow a lot of what Thomas Campbell says because he just goes on what he knows. But I do know that I want to talk to some of these beings and that's what this show's been about tonight is it's one thing to travel all of these places on your own to do your own experiments to even do psychedelics but it's another thing to meet a being that's not from here or from a different realm it does make you wonder if it's just as surprising for them you know what i mean dan like i wonder about that that's maybe that's why we don't have this full disclosure thing or we don't have aliens landing here because we're kind of freaky to them too you know right right i know over the years well over the last few years actually i've been wondering myself exactly okay who's coming <clears throat> why are they coming and when are they coming from because you know if it's it's the same if it's the same group then there's history there then they should know things about us. But if they don't know things, because they, you know, they could be like a hit and run, like these, they were saying, like, there's a group, that, they're just here to experiment and da 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 da. I'm like, well, wouldn't you already notice crap? I'm like, you're kind of like old. <laughs> and as far as the universe is concerned, with the technology that you had, you've been around quite a while. Wouldn't you have been here and already know what our energy is like and all of this stuff? But apparently not. Because if the place is so big, if the universe is so huge, then, you know, to stop over here to, to see what's going on with the, with us here is new to them, then no, they wouldn't know what our history was. No, they wouldn't know what this chemtrail stuff is. No, they wouldn't know what's going on with the direct energy weapons and the fires over there in California. That's why I was like, I was like, I wasn't sure if we would want to bring that, that subject up because we don't know what the mass, a group, uh, a group consensus would be as far as like what's going on with the events in our, in our history, you know? So it's, so, which made me think that, you know, if we were to ask them, like, the questions of the universe, why are we here and this and that, would we be able to get us out? Well, it would also be dependent on who we were talking to, right? So, if they well, did not NASA, have the history, sure. if they didn't, no, of course not. But if, you know, these aliens that don't have that kind of history, then they're not going to know. You know, they can just base it off of, you know, what they've experienced, you know, and then come from there and just, you know, try to ego flag, ego flag us with the, with that kind of stuff and say, well, this is what we've seen in other places and blah, 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 blah. So this is what probably happened with you. But that may not necessarily be true at all. Well, tell, you know, so who knows? tell me what you really think, Dan. Jesus. I'm telling you what I really think. I'm <laughs> telling you, I think these guys don't have Every, all the answers. You know, and you know that. You can tell that we we may think we're super technologically advanced and we have a lot of answers, but if you just look at that probe that NASA landed on Mars, it's not that impressive. I mean, no, no. it's it, horrible. I think uh, the not. consensus is a lot of people are bored with Mars now. They spent $425 billion on that project. And that's yeah. the machine they came up with. The damn yeah. thing, they couldn't even put windshield wipers on it. Look at that dusty How picture. How big is the damn thing? I think the thing is only as big as a golf ball, right? Something yeah. like that? Yeah, it's pretty small. You know, but, and they're going to, we're going to dig 16 not foot in the ground. Ball, I can go ball. outside and dig 16 foot in the ground. I'm not going to learn much. I exactly. promise you. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I get it. That's it's true. boring. What NASA's doing and to me is boring. I, I'm hoping there's something else going on that we just don't know about because I'm glad they got that thing to Mars. That's really cool, but... I don't see why they don't send anything to Venus. It's a much closer trip. 
You remember that movie where Matt Damon was stranded on Mars and he grew all those potatoes? I was thinking about it because you always say, I'm a potato and stuff. <laughs> I didn't watch the movie, but go ahead. You know, I think that there need to do a sequel where Matt goes to Mars and grows romaine lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> like we're running out of road. I'm I'm afraid to eat that crap now. <laughs> I got bags of it in the refrigerator. Anything. I'm not opening have, it up, man. Yeah, but have you heard of anybody? I haven't seen anything in in regards to reports of of people getting uh, violently ill from that stuff from romaine lettuce. I, it, surely eating. it should make news. If they're if they're claiming that there is a problem, then surely there should be hospital freaking you know reports of people for. But I haven't heard anything. That's why I don't listen to the CDC. They're a bunch of. I said billion. That's hooey. wrong. Four hundred twenty-five million dollars. Still, that's a lot of money to spend on that thing. That my cousin that's got a looks like he could have built. You know, just mm. I'm, I'm sure. bored with their stuff. And what are they going to do? Especially it... those pictures that they came back with. There was compared to the pictures that they showed, like the sunset on Mars and stuff like that, and then they come back with the scratchy four <laughs> four megapixel picture of whatever it was horrible. Eventually, was like, seriously, and Trump's like, "We're gonna. I want to build an architecture where <laughs> we can do stuff on the moon and move it back and forth. Then eventually, we're gonna go to Mars." Uh, why can you imagine doing the damn weather forecast in mars right highs today of a uh, minus 96 fahrenheit winds of 220 miles per hour and no precipitation for the next several million years enjoy your car ride why the hell would you want to go there you Trump know Trump is still the same person he was before he got uh he got elected and no, all he's doing is just raising noise because any news is is <laughs> keeps them relevant relevant i'm just disappointed i'm not saying that these people aren't doing a good job you know seti has been trying to get god knows they've been trying to get signals forever i'm that's great um I'm i sure guess but, but you know now harvard university's uh out there suggesting amuamua it might actually be an alien in origin and uh, I, they wrote a big paper about it that it might prove intelligent life forms could be lurking right under our nose. But they've been doing that; they do this all the time. They write up papers and they they get funded for this stuff. It gets us nowhere. Everybody has been talking about this Amua. This is like the third time they've brought up Amua Amua. But what are they going to do about it? Nothing. 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 No, the doggone thing. You guys don't understand when I'm trying to find stuff for the show. Like I'll, I will stumble upon an article like mystery glowing green fireball buzzes over Putin's top secret research lab. Sparklers, it sparks fear in Russia that they're testing advanced weapons. And how many times have you seen those little green fireballs in the sky? And I've seen them like six or seven times. What if it's aliens? It's not aliens. It's probably something a plane dropped off. You know, a big thing of poopy. You know what I'm talking about. The green flash. You've seen them before, right? Sure. This is what I'm saying. Sure. There was a bunch of, there was a rash of them not long ago, right? Like six months ago, there was yep. like a bunch of eight um, green, green balls of fire. But meanwhile, there's things happening under our noses I am worried about, like all those seismic waves that happened in, back in November 11th. They recorded uh, strange seismic waves were picking up all over the world. No big deal. You know, the center of the earth just got angry for a second. That's never happened before, but well, how come that didn't make world news? Something's not right with that. I want to see what's going on with this supernova that's supposed to happen soon. Sitting on liquid hot magma. You guys ever think about that? And the Chinese are editing people's genes, which I can't. I'm struggling with hot the magma. <laughs> yeah, liquid hot magma. <laughs> well, the Chinese, are, they're editing people's genes, and I, that kind of worries me. Uh, I get to thinking if I had a kid or I knew I was going to have a kid, would I want a doctor to come to me with a piece of paper and say, well, we can fix this and do that and make them like a brand new Chevy. Like I'm starting to think that 
nature's getting pissed off at us is what I'm saying. Be about time. One boring I thing. I think it would be about time. One thing that NASA did do, though, that's not that boring, is that they found uh, antibiotic-resistant germs on the toilets in the space station. ruh row. Germs that uh, can that can, are resistant to every antibiotic. What are they going to do? They need to blow that thing up and leave them people out there. Like, sorry, you guys got to stay out there forever now. Gonorrhea from space. <laughs> How the hell does that happen? Are they, what are they pumping in them astronauts? They must be like just giving them. I wonder if they're giving them antibiotics just for the hell of it, and it, that's how that happened. That's weird. Don't you know. know. They pack yeah. anything in these in these meals that they give them. They could stick anything in there. Say, here, deal with this for a month. Report back. <laughs> how's that? How's your gunnery? <laughs> how's your gunnery? And the one guy I looked up to, Elon Musk, it's been a hell of a week. He says that he believes we're living inside of a computer operated by an alien being. That's what happens when you start smoking weed with Joe Rogan. I bet you he just kept on doing it. And if he's right, that alien being is probably a cat that walks over the keyboard a lot like my cat does. Just screwing everything up. But it's been a fun week, Dan. I, you've been on the show quite a bit this week, and I really appreciate it. We'll have to do it again next week. You guys keep those guest suggestions coming. Appreciate the invite. Yeah, we do. We got to get out of here, though. The Secret Teachings is up next with Ryan Gable. You guys make sure you don't miss that. We'll be here back next week. Monday night, we'll be here after Deep Waters Radio, which is so the first hour will be Deep Waters with Ronnie McMullen. Then we'll be on the second and third hour during that slot. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we'll be back here again next week. I want to thank all of you guys for your support. I want to thank uh, Mr. Costa for coming on and Linda for calling in. And, uh, yeah, we're going to roll out of here. And don't forget, this show was produced by the Fringe FM and cannot be re-syndicated without written permission. And music was by Kronox, Kevin McLeod, Space Station, Bundy. New music by Carbon-Based Life Forms. Well, that song was called Interloper. Pretty cool uh, band there. Be back next week. See you guys. Good night. So my friend had the white lightning. So we did the white lightning. staff. Listener discretion is advised. We told you weeknights on the Fringe FM are now even better. And we mean it. Do it live! Where else can you hear the best shows and the best talent? Kick off your evening with our newest host, Alex Exum, live at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 Eastern. Hang out with me, Joe Roop, on Lighting the Void at 9 Pacific, Midnight Eastern. Ryan Gable expands your mind on the secret teachings at Midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern. We're bringing the heat every single night. Fire it up. The Fringe FM. Yo, there. This is G.